All right, we're going to get started. So if everyone wants to file in and grab a seat, we're going to have folks coming in and out all day. Um, so, and again, I see some with masks, some without. We have some extra uh, at the check-in desk, so it's at your discretion. Um, but I want to first welcome everyone. Good morning. Um, and welcome to the inaugural Dartmouth Faculty Symposium on Climate, Energy, and Society. Uh, it's our first ever Dartmouth Energy Week as well, so this is a really exciting day for us and an exciting week. My name is April Salas. I'm Interim Executive Director of the Arthur L. Irving Institute for Energy and Society, as well as the Executive Director for the Tuck River Center for Energy, Sustainability, and Innovation. And today marks an important milestone for the Institute and the College in our first full academic year in our building that just opened this past spring. Uh, research, scholarship, and engagement are at the core of the Institute's uh, Vision 2.0, and today is a starting point for that journey. So today is about you. It is about meeting you, learning more about your research, and you meeting each other. And for us as a community to hear the breadth of capability, depth, and expertise resonant across Dartmouth. So we have already identified over 100 faculty with research uh, that we think applies to energy, climate, health, and society. And we want to know more. So we encourage you to listen and engage and feel activated to collaborate as we move forward. We have a very exciting program lined up for today. And before I turn the mic over uh, to get things started, I would like to first thank the Institute team for bringing this event to life, uh, as well as for their day-to-day -day commitment to energy and society at the Institute. So Angie Hoffman, uh, today thank you so much, Angie. She's new to our team and has done an incredible job uh, meeting with all of you and really bringing this event to life. So thank you so much, Angie. Melissa Weinstein, Stephanie Garcia, Andrilla Haight, uh, Kristen Miller, Amanda Graham, Megan Litweiler, Angus McReynolds, as well as Stephen Doig. Thank you, Stephen, for being here. So thank you all. And it's now my distinct pleasure to turn it over to Barbara Will, Vice Provost for Strategic Initiatives, who has been a steadfast partner of the Institute as we define and shape our strategic, strategic vision for the future. Barbara. Sorry about all that static. Um, thanks, April, and uh, special thanks to April Salas, the interim executive director for the Irving Institute, and a real lodestar in helping us think about the direction we want to go in um, with this institute. It's wonderful to be here today. Thank you for showing up so early. The coffee, by the way, has arrived, in case you didn't notice. Um, and let's get started with an exciting day. Um, as we all know, we're here today because our climate crisis is growing exponentially. In this year alone in the United States, we've seen drought and wildfires in the west, hurricanes in the south and southeast, and as of a few weeks ago, I have learned that Three of the Florida Keys are now uninhabitable. Abroad, we've seen life-altering floods in Pakistan, devastating heat waves in India, and unbearable heat also in places like Paris and London. This climate change new normal seems to be inexorably leading us down the path toward what the author David Wallace Wells calls uninhabitable Earth. That's one of the scariest books I've ever read. The difficult coordinates of our present day moment might easily lead to despair. And yet, on this day we're here not to recount the devastating effect of global warming on our own lives and on those of our students and our children and our grandchildren but to borrow the wise words of our Director of Sustainability, Rosie Kerr, we're here today in a spirit of hope to help with solutions, adaptations, and mitigations, and above all, to figure out the tools we need to address this looming crisis. I think all of us, certainly I speak for myself, feel a strong sense of urgency about where we are today. 
This coming decade may, in fact, be one of the most critical of our lifetimes. And yet, we know this problem is bigger than one, one researcher or one institution, one college like Dartmouth. To confront this threat, we have to work together. We're therefore calling on all of you, scientists, humanists, social scientists, medical researchers, community members, to use this symposium to forge collaborations in this small world we're in right here at Dartmouth to find solutions that are implementable within the next five to 10 years. As a start, today is an opportunity to learn about climate and energy related research and work across this campus. It's a chance to help all of us, you and me, find out what we're doing. A lot of us don't even know what we're doing in, on this campus, even though there's so many people, as April just said, who are working in this space. It's a chance to help us imagine how the biggest federal funding on climate ever, the Inflation Reduction Act, can set the stage for find, finding answers to global warming. It's also a call to action led by the Irving Institute for Energy and Society to mobilize resources, academic knowledge, and technical expertise to avoid the worst of what's in front of us. And I'm excited because I know at Dartmouth, we have the depth of knowledge and we have the will to address these issues. We have incredible and broad and untapped strengths to collaborate with one another. So please join me in enjoying this day today as we learn more about the climate related research happening at Dartmouth. Please join me as you're inspired by the, what our colleagues can do and will do. And please remember that if we work together, we can not only address this climate crisis, but also turn it into an opportunity to improve our societies and deliver benefits for people worldwide. So with that, I am going to give the floor back to April, who's going to present the plan for today. Thank you very much and look forward to chatting more during the break with you. Thank you so much, Barbara. And as you've heard, the time is now and we would like to embark on this next journey with the spirit of hope. As we embark on the next chapter of the Irving Institute, we see the opportunity in the energy transition to meet the needs in a way that sustains people and the planet. So we exist to advance Dartmouth's interdisciplinary excellence in engineering, business, and the liberal arts in the context of addressing our world's critical energy and society issues. I believe Dartmouth's distinctiveness and impact is rooted in its world-class interdisciplinary approach and flexibility. It's applied work in the real world its student focus with both research and teaching, and its passionate on-campus global community of leaders and experts. So we will make our biggest difference for our world by working together and through our research and engagement, and as a leading educational institution, preparing students to be leaders across climate, energy, health, and society. As such, we are launching three overlapping strategic hubs of integrated and applied research and education that uh, leverage Dartmouth's distinctive competencies, advance our thought leadership, and expand on our real-world impact. These hubs are a framework for organizing research groups or clusters and will allow us to be nimble and responsive with a clear focus on accelerating the pace of change and increasing impact. The hubs, innovation and policy technology and markets, social impact and the energy transition, and uncommon dialogue partnerships will be resourced and supported each cultivating strategic research priorities, funding targets, and collaborative engagement needs in partnership with the Irving Institute. So for me, today is about listening and learning from all of you, what you're focused on, and for all of us to seek to identify areas of awareness, just knowing what colleagues are working on, as Barbara mentioned, areas for possible collaboration, and areas that we, at the Institute, can work to build capabilities with you where they are yet to exist. So thank you so much for being here today. 
really excited to kick the program off, and we will get started on time with our first session uh, with faculty lightning talks on studying, modeling, and monitoring climate change, climate adaptations, climate mitigations, and communications and messaging. So I'd like to invite those faculty to join us in the front. of biological sciences here at Dartmouth. And what we're interested in is targeting plant hormones to mediate adaptation to a changing climate. And part of So part of what we're interested in is really a problem that has to do with abiotic stress um, in the environment and how this affects uh, crops. Um, and so the problem is really this idea of drought and salinity stress are major abiotic stresses limiting crop productivity worldwide with 30% uh, of our, all arable land is really affected by drought stress and 20% by salt stress. And by arable land in this case means actual land that's worked for crops, not just potentially being used for crops. Um, so this becomes a fairly uh, significant effect upon crop productivity, and the idea is that this is predicted to get worse and worse with climate change in the future. And so part of what my research group is interested in is really, um, can we sort of work with the plant, plant hormone responses to modulate uh, crops so they have increased resistance to drought and salt stress? And this gets to really the two plant hormones that my research group works with, which are cytokinin, which is an adding derivative, and ethylene, which is this gaseous hormone that people know perhaps best for the old adage of one bad apple spoils one, the whole bunch, because ripening apples release ethylene, and that it, it instigates more ripening in neighboring fruit. Um, but both these plant hormones have fairly large effects throughout plant growth and development. Um, cytokinins one considers sort of as a youthful hormone, and they're involved in, um, regulating grain yield. And so for example, this is showing a rice grain producing panicle. And on the left, we have a variety that produces less cytokinin, and on the right is one that produces more cytokinin. So there's very large effects upon cytokinin in terms of making stem cell centers to produce grain. The other aspect of cytokinin that gets uh, fairly well known is its role in greening. And so on the right here is basically a senescent leaf, but with two sectors that have high cytokinin activity, and that prevents them from being senescent. Um, ethylene has really almost the opposite effect as a hormone, in which it's tending to be more of an aging hormone we tend to think of. And so that, in this case, we have, for example, is known to be reducing ripening, and if we look outside, it's involved in regulating senescence or aging of tissues. Um, and both these hormones then regulate a lot about plant growth and development, and part of looking at stress responses, there is the idea of either avoidance or tolerance. And so avoidance has to do with the ability to sort of change, for example, root system architecture. And both these hormones regulate the sort of structure of the root system. And so for example, if you have a deeper root system, you become more drought tolerant, or yeah, drought avoidant. Um, the other aspect is that's less sort of obvious is the role in uh, 
abiotic stress uh, tolerance and point that these hormones often regulate um, sort of pr production of osmoprotectants, which can help with drought and salt stress, um, antioxidants, species, and also potentially sequestering salts into the backfill or preventing salts from being mobilized from the root to the shoot. Um, so we're really trying to take uh, gene editing approaches to knock out these genes, particularly in rice, to sort of investigate how these are able to help protect against both drought and salt stress. Um, looking both at the idea of avoidance as well as tolerance approaches. And partly that becomes a bit interesting from our perspective because based on previous research, it's uh, sort of unpredictable as to what the effects will be. And that's where we're going, exploring right now. Good morning. I'm Elijah Stommel. I work over at the Medical Center and a mineralogist there. I've been interested in ALS for years. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or Lou Gehrig's disease, or ALS, motor neuron disease, is a horrible disease. It comes on usually in the late 50s to mid 60s. Um, you get atrophy. You can get uh, a lack of uh, swallowing and, and a lack of speech. Uh, you can become spastic, and usually you only survive for about two or three years, um, usually die of respiratory arrest. Um, it seems to be becoming more common in certain parts of the world, especially it's been shown in Australia to be increasing in incidence. Uh, it's probably a disease that has both genetic and environmental um, factors that play into it. Much like smoking, not everybody who smokes cigarettes gets lung cancer. Not everybody who's exposed to X, Y, and Z gets, gets ALS. And it's probably a combination of toxins over time. In Guam, back in the 1940s, when the island was taken away from the Japanese uh, by the Americans, um, the military moved there. And they noticed a very high uh, rate of ALS and uh, dementia and Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease. Um, it was called litigo bodic disease. And uh, this is a person with, with uh, ALS on the left. You see the atrophy. This is somebody who looks Parkinsonian with a sort of mass looking face. And there's a great book written by Oliver Sacks about this island. Um, <clears throat> the natives there were eating uh, flour made from cycad seeds. And um, of course, the toxicologists and epidemiologists went there when they saw this very high rate of ALS and these other diseases. And they found in the roots of the cycad plant were these green rings, if you cut them in, in cross-section. And those are actually cyanobacteria. And the natives knew that this flour they were making out of the seeds was toxic. And they had to wash it many, many times because it would burn in their mouth and cause GI upset and other things. There were also these flying foxes that were eating the cycad seeds and biomagnifying um, the toxins that the cyanobacteria were making. One of them is called BMAA. Um, BMAA is an amino acid that can get in the translational process of making proteins and it will make proteins misfold. This was some work done by Paul Cox and his group from Wyoming in St. Kitts where they um, fed vervet monkeys BMAA and were able to reproduce the pathology of Alzheimer's disease and Guamanian ALS. I don't have time to go into any details. Um, 
We mapped out all our ALS patients at Dartmouth Hitchcock several years ago now and found a clustering of ALS around Lake Muscoma. They have annual cyanobacterial blooms. Since this was done in 2009, we've seen about twice this number of patients around this lake. Um, and we've done some studies looking at aerosol, and we've been able to identify VMAA um, in lung tissue in filters where we're collecting aerosol and be able to find it in the water and fish out of the lake. It's exactly the same cyanobacteria that are in the roots of the cycad plant. With some remote sensing expertise of Nathan Torbick, we've been able to show geospatial statistical correlation between poor water quality that's conducive of cyanobacterial blooms <laughs> and where our ALS patients are. So that's kind of a, a neat project that we did. Uh, this is Lake Champlain uh, in the summertime. Uh, it has huge effects on the environment. Some of these toxins are very acute and will kill domestic animals. So if a dog went down and, and drank this, it would kill it in a few minutes. Um, there's one toxin called anatoxin AS, which is uh, 2,000 times more potent than the typical pesticide that's put on farm fields. It's an organophosphate pesticide. And um, you can see some of the clustering of ALS along Lake Champlain there on the far right. Um, this are two uh, areas. This is uh, on Lake Champlain, Shelburne Bay on the left, and a small pond near Tilton, New Hampshire, both of which have terrible blooms in the summer. We identified conjugal couples, so people who lived in the same house together and came down with ALS within a couple of years of each other. Um, there are all these risk factors that have been putatively identified in, in ALS. Um, it's probably a mixture of toxins over time. And what we hope to do in the future is be able to identify what the um, sequence of exposures is and what the combinatorial um, effects are over time. But uh, these blooms are increasing everywhere in the world, especially in Australia, and um, they have uh, major effects on the economy. Um, they're fueled by increasing temperatures, and they're fueled by the nutrients, phosphorus, and nitrogen, which are um, increasing. So I'll stop there. Hi everyone, I am, uh, I call myself an environmental social scientist, um, I'm in the Department of Environmental Studies. My primary focus of research is on uh, small scale irrigation and fishery systems, but I've increasingly been thinking about the ap ap applicability of theories on small scale systems to larger scale systems like climate change. And so I'm going to talk to you about two ways I've been thinking about that. And so uh, I, I titled this talk, uh, Two Models of Thinking About Climate Change and Climate Policy. Uh, we'll see if I get to the second one, given that these are lightning talks. But one of the main uh, stories that uh, people in my field tell ourselves about our relationship to the environment, um, when we're dealing with uh, farmers and fishers who are extracting shared natural resources, is that we want to avoid this thing called the tragedy of the commons. And the tragedy of commons, which is popularized by Gary Hardin, but not um, introduced by him originally, is this idea, right, that if we have a shared resource like a fishery, like groundwater, um, we have a shared interest, if there's a community of, of us using the same resource, in sustaining this. So there's this idea that if we can all work together, we can avoid the tragedy of the commons of any one person uh, using too much that accumulates up to us. Um, uh, deteriorating the resource, and then that leads to a tragedy for all. So it's this idea that there's kind of a lose-lose involved in this. So behind the idea of the tragedy of the commons is this idea of a collective action problem. And uh, a collective action problem is very straightforward, the divergence between what's in the good of the individual in a group and what's in the interest of the group as a whole. 
And I call this a boundary object. I have several colleagues on campus whose theory is also motivated by this idea of a collective action problem. My favorite example is my friend Karen Adell, who essentially studies collective action among bacteria and the collective interest among a lot of them are the biofilms they produce. Um, so I think this is a really important transdisciplinary boundary, uh, boundary object that a lot of us can be using. One thing that, so I've taught this concept in my policy class for years, and one of the things that my students have really struggled with is identifying what is this collective good? Because you know, it's part of the definition that there's a difference between the individual and the collective good. And they all they all kind of struggle with, okay, like what is the actual public interest here? What's, what is the shared interest here? And, um, that led me to this question, which is, um, is climate change ultimately a collective action problem? Can we think about a collective good, a collective good when it comes to the climate change problem? To give you a, a, a very simple example, uh, here I've kind of drawn up just a basic irrigation system of upstream farmer, downstream farmer. This is not a, col a collective action problem because there's an asymmetry in how much this person influences that person. And that's something that I've seen in my own work a lot. And the social implications of that asymmetry are very different. It's harder to get people to act pro-socially when they don't have the interdependence implied by um, a lack of asymmetry. Two inspirations for this um, reframing of things not necessarily being oriented around collective action problems. A colleague of mine at Dartmouth, D.G. Webster, wrote a book called The Tragic Commons that applies this reframing to the sector of fisheries. Um, this really great book called Winners Take All by Anand Grivaratis. And his main argument is that we need to not necessarily be overly tempted by kind of win-win framings about how we solve our problems, right? Because collective action is a potentially win-win framing. If we all work together, we can all benefit, and maybe no one has to lose more than someone else. His basic argument, his basic polemic is that that's attractive because if, if it's apolitical, right? If there's no winners and losers, then we can all kind of get together. We don't have to worry about one person losing more than someone else. And so from a political feasibility perspective, maybe win-win framings like collective action have an advantage, but they kind of artificially depoliticize the, the discourse in a way that's maybe actually not realistic. So um, the second model that I just want to mention that I think needs to complement our traditional collective active framing, both of local issues and of climate change, comes from the system architect literature, and it's called shifting the burden. So just to run through this really quickly, this says there's an underlying problem that produces a symptom. Once we have the symptom, we can go one of two ways. We can adopt a fundamental solution. We can adopt a symptomatic solution. You can see that this loop, right, you're dealing only with the symptomatic solution, not necessarily a fundamental one if you just deal with the symptoms. Um, you know, this is the rhetoric, the discourse of like band-aid solutions that we worry a lot about, right? Uh, the symptomatic solution can also reinforce via lock-in. Um, can inhibit ultimately getting to the fundamental solution as we adopt social and human and technological capital oriented around this. So again, I, I think this is relevant for my own uh, primary research in fisheries. The cod fishery, uh, which collapsed in the Northern Atlantic, largely followed a pattern of overuse, symptoms being that catches went down, but then the, the solutions were technical solutions of new gear that were used that hid the problem over time, and so we didn't see the problem until it was too late. And so the final thing I say is that I think this can be applied to climate change, and this is a question I'm always asking when we think about geoengineering, carbon capture, and for me in particular, I'm interested in, in car the carbon offset space, which I think is particularly problematic, and also could be interpreted by asking these types of questions about when we need to address the fundamental solution versus the symptom. Thanks. So um, I'm going to give a, a more of a landscape than dive into any one thing. But the work I've been doing really over the last 25 years or so has fallen into broadly two buckets on the left, um, which are how do you coordinate knowledge work across boundaries, both firm and language and time um, and organizational. So that's essentially designing complex supply chains. 
And then in the middle is the work that I've done really going back into the 90s, which began with a really simple question of why is it that Twin Peaks got canceled? People said, okay, what does Twin Peaks have to do with network effects? Well, it turns out that uh, the associated question was, why is so much stuff on the web free? This was back when a disk box of, of Lotus 1, 2, 3 cost like $500. And then all of a sudden we're getting Internet Explorer uh, and tools like that. And Netscape cost tens or hundreds of millions of development dollars um, with no particularly um, good reason or expectation that they would ever charge anything above zero. Um, so what that needed to solve the problem was some innovation in network effect economics. And so that's kind of at the core of what we did, say, around 2000 through 2005. Um, that was at about the same time as the rise of what we'll call the tech industry or the platform companies. And it turned out to be a, a useful theoretical framework to help explain really what we saw in broad swaths of the economy. Um, you felt a little bit like a, a horseman in the wilderness saying, hey, the tech companies are coming because in, quote, the real economy, oil, gas, banking, manufacturing, um, they dominated in size. And so people didn't really think that this was interesting or important. But of course, around 2015, 2016, that completely changed. And you had sort of the obvious dominance of, of the technology firms. So that's sort of the backdrop um, of where we've been spending a lot of our time. So that has a bunch of applications. And so I just thought I'd go through a few because I thought the point here was to try to make some connections you know, across campus. Um, so one is, I've been I'm frequently asked, well, all of that stuff you guys talked about, most of that looks like business to, to consumer. Um, and that was largely true. And for lots of reasons, not least of which is the transaction costs of getting to Google and getting them to adopt something are a lot lower um, than they are to land, say, a, a solution inside of a complex environment where you have a lot of integration. Um, so we're kind of digging into the economics um, across a number of industries. So that's one project I'm in the middle of. Another one is literally trying to understand the impact on both the digital supply chain and then the associated physical supply chain of a multinational. So think of like an auto manufacturing company um, of this increasing digital divide, primarily between the U.S. and China. But of course, you've got things like the GDPR and now the Digital Markets and Digital Services Act in Europe that are also starting to bifurcate or trifurcate these systems. And so that has implications. Um, implications, for example, around ESG, environmental sustainability goal tracking. How do you, how do you know? I mean, last December, the ships with China registries disappeared off of the uh, automatic identification system. They went dark. Um, for various reasons, not least of which was part of this inability to decide to share data. You say, well, what does data, platforms, and network effects have to do with climate and sustainability? Well, a whole bunch. Um, because if you look, uh, what we did with some World Economic Forum work over the last couple of years was discover that firms that were able to pivot rapidly in the face of dramatic supply and demand disruption um, were those that had already done the hard work of end-to-end -end digitalization, so they had visibility right from the factory floor through the supply chain. Well, it turns out that same visibility that allows you to do disruption adaptation is what you need to do visibility so that you can have a credible metric and commitment around your emissions, around your environmental impact. Um, so lots of different examples. I was told three minutes and I've taken four. Um, so plenty of application. Uh, EVs, uh, um, health tech has been a really fun one that I've had some fun with, or you know, been working on a lot. Um, future of work with some Song Foundation work. Um, they've gotten pulled into antitrust with the European Research Commission for the commission. Um, but if you go back, really, it all goes down to the same foundations. So I think of those as a bunch of application areas, but it's really about coordination on complex systems across boundaries where you have strong network effects. Okay.
heating devices are kind of interesting. Okay, uh, so I'm in computer science, I work on computer security, and uh, for about 20 years now, uh, I've been part of some consortiums looking at security issues in smart infrastructure, starting with the power grid. Uh, so, you know, electricity for, can't efficiently be stored in large quantities yet, uh, so even 20 years ago, the uh, power grid required a lot of delicate real-time control to keep everything working well. And then as, you know, visions of uh, uh, let's make it more efficient, let's make it smarter, uh, to allow, as Jeff put it, the um, coordination uh, among all kinds of different things, uh, that requires more, putting more smart computing devices in different places all over the place and having them all work with each other uh, over industrial control systems and things. And the problem is, uh, somehow in the field of computing, we aren't able to build devices that don't have holes, that don't have uh, interfaces that can be manipulated in devious ways. Uh, so a consequence uh, of adding all this smart infrastructure is that then we move the, um, whoa, we had some interesting conversion happen here. Uh, we move the attack surface from behind a few locked doors to everywhere. Uh, and uh, what a malicious actor could do to cause all kinds of havoc uh, is, uh, is now it's much easier. Uh, 15 years ago or so, there was a Wall Street Journal article with an analysis about how to do something really catastrophic in the power grid at the time, you had to touch, do the wrong thing in nine different places at the same time. And that was impossible, but now it's trivial. Uh, so that's a problem. What do we do about that? Uh, so about 15 years, my team has been working on, on a bunch of tools for this stuff, how to discover vulnerabilities in, in industrial control systems, in energy initially, uh, how to mitigate them. Uh, if you have a you know, small, limited power computing device uh, sitting on top of a telephone pole as part of some distribution thing that no one is ever going to push an update to, how does that still work once it gets compromised? Uh, and then, you know, well, why don't we just build computing systems in a better way? Uh, so we've been doing a lot of stuff, actually based on formal language theory, to build uh, you know, how to prevent uh, these kinds of zero days before they happen, and particularly your hardened parsers for a whole suite of uh, uh, industrial control things used in energy. And uh, thanks to our industrial partners, um, you know, this isn't just oops, stay here at Dartmouth. A lot of this stuff is now out in the real world uh, being used in a lot of places. Uh, and, uh, and we're continuing this work. Uh, so I will finish ahead of time. <laughs> Thank you, I'm Charlie Sullivan, and I'm going to talk about uh, how magnetics enable power electronics, which then enable efficiency and renewables. And that's the same title slide. So first, what is power electronics? Power electronics is electronics that performs energy conversion. And so that's used in a lot of places for renewable energy and energy efficiency. The uh, key renewable energy sources like solar and wind, the raw electricity that they produce isn't directly compatible with the grid. So there's essential power electronics in there that, that interfaces that. It's used in some transmission and distribution and, and virtually all storage. Um, oh, that's not quite true. It, it's used in a lot of newer types of storage, not traditional pumped hydro kind of storage. But then if we look at end use technologies, and we look at any use of energy, and we say, what's the best, most efficient way to accomplish that task? It pretty much universally involves power electronics. If you think of any exceptions to that, let me know during the break, because it's really <laughs> hard to find them. So uh, we have the Power Management Integration Center, which is a NSF IUCRC collaborative. Uh, operation with UC San Diego, Dartmouth, and 10 member companies that are working across a lot of those different areas. 
I personally work on magnetic components, inductors and transformers for power electronics because that's one of the key limitations that I think we can make improvements on, or we have been able to make improvements on. And uh, this is an example of the semiconductor parts of a power converter, and it's been super miniaturized, and that progress continues at an amazing pace. But then if you look at the whole system, that's a, the full power converter that that goes in, and you see it's dominated by these magnetic components, um, which, you know, they're big, but they're also expensive. They also limit the efficiency, limit a lot of other aspects of the performance. So some of the things we've done is we've developed models and optimization methods for high frequency magnetics at high frequency. In principle, the, the new semiconductors make the high frequency possible, and then uh, that enables smaller magnetics in theory, in really simple theory. In practice, it often doesn't work out that way. And so modeling those effects, doing optimization on that can really make it better. We've developed magnetics and circuit designs that are used in things like solar inverters, computers. Uh, we've also developed these uh, resonant coil structures that work very well for wireless power transfer. That's spun, been spun out into a, a company that's developing that. As far as future challenges and opportunities, I'll say that I'm interested, these are the things that we're working on. I'm also interested in collaborations on the much broader issues in end use of energy, et cetera. But uh, one of the challenges is models for nonlinear loss effects in high frequency soft magnetic materials. They're nonlinear effects where we understand the idea of the physics, but we don't understand the details. So we have these really awful, crude, semi empirical models, which I'm embarrassed to say I'm kind of responsible for a lot of the models that are used, <laughs> but they're pretty pathetic, so we want to do better. Um, there are some applications that still use old, like 1940s technology that have just kind of gotten stuck, so we're trying to get those unstuck. And there are also extensions of these resonant components, both electromagnetic resonators and piezoelectric resonators. We're developing those components further and developing their applications further could give us better, uh, better systems. All right, that's it. Uh, 
what we can say about the pattern in the rivers, what that says about the water pressure underneath the ice sheet um, and the instabilities involved there. And we also care about the flow of the sediment beneath the glaciers. Uh, oh, that was not supposed to happen. <laughs> There's supposed to be a video there. Um, and how the sediment deforms and what we can say from previously glaciated regions, how we can look at sort of the footprints of previous ice sheets to understand how the ice sheet was at present for some reason. Um, yeah, there's various consensuses in the group, but generally along the lines of what's going on under ice sheets, going on under ice sheets, how can we understand that better and how can we constrain it better to put into large scale models and improve sort of on a broader scale our estimates of sea level rise and future climate change. My name is Huan Zhao. I'm a PhD student. Today I'm uh, on behalf of my PI, Dr. Liang Li, to talk about metal material design in energy collection. So um, in our daily life, uh, we actually in unintentionally wasted a lot of mechanical energy, um, including like um, from building or bridge oscillations, or from our body motions, or from vehicle vibrations. So um, the way we collect this um, wasted mechanical energy is to use piezoelectric energy harvester. Um, so this is served as a converter between the mechanical and electrical energy. And um, once we collect all this um, e electrical energy, we put it back to the sensors are, that are embedded in those systems. So what we work on is to um, amplify or in improve this efficiency, com conversion efficiency, by using metal material. So um, let me talk about what metal material is. So by definition, metal material is a material engineered to have a property that is not found naturally in naturally occurring materials. Um, they have many merits, including highly tunable uh, mechanical property, and also a highly controllable deformation mechanism. And on the right, you can see some of the examples of the metal material unicells and lattices. <coughs> um, so one project we work on is metal material design for self-sustaining lattice pacemaker. So in this application, the lattice or the metal material design will be placed at the bottom of uh, the pacemaker to receive the a mechanical input from the contraction of the heart. Um, so we, from our uh, final element analysis, we found that the voltage that's collected by the, um, by the lattice is the highest amount when it compares to bulk and porous material. Um, the reason we found is that um, there are many local strain uh, concentrations in this um, lattice design which then cause a highest overall strain energy that's collected by the lattice design. Um, this means that the lattice design can collect the mechanical energy more efficiently, um, so which cause uh, a higher output from this uh, designs. And also, um, we have another ongoing project that's funded by uh, NASA that we're trying to develop a self-sustaining uh, power uh, sensor that's um, for space applications. And unlike the other traditional sensors, these sensors uh, can work under a high temperature, which is at least 200 degrees um, Celsius. And uh, we also implement metal material design into those uh, sensors to improve the conversion efficiency. And um, that's all for my presentation today. Thank you very much.
one more slide, I guess. <laughs> so hi everyone, my name is Marin Greenleaf. I'm an assistant professor in anthropology. And I just wanted to introduce myself and my work today. So I'm a sociocultural and environmental anthropologist and political ecologist. I'm also trained as an environmental uh, and climate lawyer. So I like to say, you know, in law school I learned about uh, environmental and climate policies and how they're supposed to work. And then as an anthropologist, I study what actually happens. So um, I go out, that means I do mostly ethnographic <coughs> methods. Um, going and doing in-depth uh, interviews, also participant observations. So I'm interested in what people say when they're asked about environmental and climate issues, and also what they say when they're not asked about it in their daily lives. So my research focus is on human environment relations in a changing climate, and I'm particularly interested in efforts to create, quote, green economies and landscapes. And I conducted long-term research on carbon offsets in the Brazilian Amazon. So here you see me doing some of that research. I was talking to these um, folks about the acai berries that they've collected. They're in the sacks here. Uh, and they got them from the forest behind them. <coughs> so I've, uh, uh, the, my main finding here is basically the dominant understanding of carbon offsets is, is that they involve the creation of markets and private property. But I argue that in in the Brazilian Amazon, they involve the creation of kind of a green welfare state and inclusive green capitalism uh, in, in kind of contradiction to, to the mainstream findings. I'm working on a new ethnographic project now called Cities of Trees, Reforesting the Birthplace of Industrial Capitalism. So here, <coughs> I'm looking at efforts to reforest um, this large uh, swath of very urbanized land you see here. Um, which is also where industrial capitalism developed. So I'm asking here, how do 50 million planted trees become a forest? Um, so this is a project about um, kind of living through the Anthropocene and climate change. And then also wanted to flag uh, an educational and research initiative I've developed with Irving Institute support uh, called the Energy Justice Clinic, and our mission is to support just energy transitions through engaged scholarship and education. Um, so you can see a panel we hosted last week, hosted in this room on uh, equity and uh, energy here in the Upper Valley. We have case studies here in the Upper Valley, but also uh, in southern Chile and elsewhere, and we work with um, community partners and students um, in these projects. Thank you. Thank you uh, for this opportunity for me to share a little bit what we do in the Crable Lab and how, I think, can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Uh, how that can be impacted by, um, by climate change in general. So uh, my title is, well, I'll go to the next one. So climate change driven virulence adaptations in human fungal pathogens. Uh, so we study uh, fungal pathogens, but I do want to highlight that not all fungi are bad. Actually, a lot of fungi are uh, quite important for components of carbon cycles and carbon storage could be leveraged in the future. Um, and actually most fungi currently cannot grow in the mammalian body due to the uh, non-permissive body temperature that we have, as well as the innate, in, in the strong innate and in, um, adaptive immunity that we have. However, um, as we as is kind of highlighted here, I just need to um, there are several different you know effects in the environment that could provide stresses um, where the fungi can start adapting to these stresses and become um, able to grow in a host relevant environment. One example is this out recent outbreak of Canada auris, which is a pathogenic yeast that arose um, almost simultaneously in several locations around the earth. Um, 
And the hypothesis behind this is that it adapted to higher temperatures, which allowed it to grow in the human, um, in its uh, natural niche due to climate change, um, and then was moved into urban centers where it now it wreaks, havoc in, or wreaks havoc in hospitals. And so I also want to share just an example of what we do in the Kramer lab um, and how showing how fungi can adapt to atmos different as atmospheric conditions. So we study this pathogenic mold, Aspergillus fumigatus, um, and we mainly study its adaptation to limited ox oxygen availability. So Aspergillus is a saprophytic, environmentally ubiquitous mold involved in composting. Um, its infections are generally associated with immune suppression and pulmonary disease. Um, as you can see in this image up in the top uh, right, uh, where the red, and so it, these uh, fungi, when they infect, they actually form their own zones of low oxygen. But we wanted to ask the question, you know, it can grow in these zones of low oxygen, indicated in red, um, but can it adapt to grow better in this situation? So we did all this uh, lab, uh, laboratory evolutionary experiment where we passaged our uh, laboratory strains for about two months in a hypoxic uh, condition. We found that we could actually evolve it so that it grew stronger. And importantly, this evolutionary uh, change allowed it to become more virulent in the host environment, uh, indicating that these adaptations are quite important. Um, and so with that, I just want to highlight, you know, how can we prevent future outbreaks, uh, which could come from, you know, current, say, plant pathogens that adapt to higher temperatures or differing atmospheric conditions to grow inside the host. Uh, one being invest energy in development and novel antifungal drugs is this kind of a front line. We also increase research on those non-human fungal pathogens uh, to be ready for those possible jumps, as well as possible, you know, the possibility of mitigating selective pressures in the environment where possible. And uh, with that, I just want to uh, show off the Kramer Lab where I work, and uh, thank you for listening. <laughs> Yeah, there, there, what's, what's that? There's a story there, isn't there? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> At least two stories, I guess. It's actually a very updated uh, photo that we just showed. <laughs> That's the... They all have chickens. Good morning, everyone. So my name is Jifeng Liu. I work at Thayer School of Engineering. Uh, my research is basically on photonic and electronic materials. So today I'm going to uh, talk a common topic through four of my projects, uh, not by accident, uh, that basically atomic ordering uh, basically can change the material properties and to benefits for the energy material applications, both renewable energy and energy efficiency. So first of all, what do we mean by atomic ordering? So let's uh, suppose that each of you sitting in this room is an atom. And all the seats here is basically what's called atomic sites. And interestingly, for some material systems, just by simply changing your seats, change the seats, same people, same seats, you create different properties of material. Uh, so sometimes you care about the ordering of those uh, 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 the people in the seats. So for example, the uh, people from the same department are assigned to the uh, same set, uh, set of group of seats. And that's basically what we call the uh, order, disorder transitions. So that actually has a profound impact on the properties as you here, so here. Basically uh, for thermoelectric materials where we harvest free seeds into electricity. So uh, you, you see basically we have a, a, a lot of waste heat generated. Uh, and basically it's a pity if we don't recover part of that. Uh, the challenge is that the current thermoelectric materials to do that job are uh, uh, exotic semiconductors like bismuth territe. They're expensive, they're very brittle, uh, basically very hard to scale. So uh, my, my colleagues and I, uh, Professor Ian Baker, uh, Japan Hotier and myself, basically working on an earth-bound solution to that, basically is iron vanadium aluminum uh, system. And this system basically found that by engineering the, the degree of atomic ordering, as we show uh, down here, <coughs> Basically, you can see that uh, we can engineer the thermal properties of materials. We can minimize the thermal conductivity while maximize the electrical uh, voltage output at the same time. Uh, recently, we have been able to uh, basically reach the same level of bismuth terrorite, and basically, uh, that's very exciting news uh, for those uh, applications. 
So uh, in other cases, the atoms do not care too much about the exact uh, arranging those uh, in an order fashion, but rather they care about uh, their nearest neighbors. So look around you, who are your nearest neighbors, who are your second nearest neighbors. And that applies to the case of this semiconductor uh, uh, alloy material called silicon germane tin. So basically on the right side of the panel. Uh, basically in this material system, we are incorporating uh, cyclings of silicon down the periodic table, germanium tin, to extend the functionality of silicon microchips. So interestingly, uh, depending on how you put the neighbors around the tin atoms, so the top one basically will show a case, we have uh, quite a few of uh, nearest neighbors being tin atoms. Uh, the second case down, uh, down on, on the bottom here, basically we show that uh, tin atoms are well separated. They have second nearest neighbors, they don't have first nearest neighbor. That will drastically change the electronic uh, energy band structure of the material and change their electrical properties. So utilizing this behavior, we're trying to, uh, under the support of the DOE Energy Research Frontier Center, awarded recently, we're trying to engineer those uh, transitions to get uh, more functionalities into the microchips and to do computing in a more energy efficient way. So basically, uh, this is uh, just two of the cases. We can also have other cases that you have not just one type of seeds, you have two types of seeds. Maybe one seed is more expensive than the other. <laughs> Uh, but essentially, uh, in this case, uh, we also have a scenario that if you divide your colleagues from the same department in different ratios among two different types of seats, uh, you get very different re optical response in different spectrum. So that applies to the case of my uh, project on uh, solar uh, uh, absorbers for high temperature applications. So in this case, we're basically trying to harvest solar energy directly into heat. And in this case, we're looking for a working temperature, uh, 750 Celsius that can push the uh, power cycle efficiency above 50%. So key to this uh, technology is basically you need a very high efficiency solar absorber here that's also very stable at high temperatures. So what we're working on is basically this uh, spinel oxide and a particle as pigments. And it turns out if you can uh, uh, introduce uh, 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 different elements to actually distribute the copper and manganese ions on two different kind of lighter sites, A site and B site, octahedral and tetrahedral sites uh, in different ratio, can optimize the visible light response absorption versus the infrared uh, emittance. So that uh, allows us to achieve 94% 90, uh, efficiency recently, which is one of the highest demonstrated in, in the system so far. And finally, you may ask, how about we just have uh, people from many departments, great diversity, and we just mix randomly on those in, in this room, right? Taking seeds randomly. What does that make? Well, we also have a, a case like that. That's what's called high entropy alloys. Uh, basically, iron based, uh, iron manganese based high entropy alloys were uh, first developed by Professor Ian Baker, my colleague sitting here. And this is actually a pretty interesting solution to the tubing materials for solar thermal applications. As you mentioned, basically, we're looking for a material that works at high temperature without sagging, without uh, corrosion. And essentially, this high entropy alloys can actually uh, do the stuff by incorporating. Uh, five different elements on, uh, on the latter sites, uh, basically to uh, implement this uh, functionality. And what's more, if you oxidize the surface, you can get, get a very nice solar absorber. So uh, to conclude, I basically want to show you that to solve the big problem of energy and sustainability, we probably want need to uh, dive down deep all the way to the atomic scale. And in the light of that statement, I predict that uh, after some reshuffling of our, of our seats after the coffee break or the lunch, uh, we have a totally different and interesting chemistry in this uh, symposium. Thank you. Good morning, I'm so grateful to be here. My name is Sarah Crockett. I am uh, an emergency physician and um, here to talk kind of on a big picture about health and climate change. Um, so I work at uh, Dartmouth Hitchcock and also at Geisel. And I think this statement really kind of captures it all from the World Health Organization. Climate change is the single biggest health threat facing humanity. Um, I think that for whatever reason, the medical profession has sat on the sidelines of this for far too long. 
And so my work is really to bring together people so we can address this as a health crisis. Um, this is a graphic from the CDC that really captures you know, each of these things that we are familiar with in terms of what climate change is doing to our environment, the rising temperatures, extreme weather, um, sea level changes impacts our environment, which then has drastic consequences on our human health. We could spend uh, an entire course just talking about this graphic, but I only have three minutes, so we'll be quick. <laughs> um, so what is it that I do? Well, I would say on a big picture, I am all about education and creating collaborations, which is exactly what we're doing here today. Um, I've been working uh, in partners across our campus, um, creating new uh, educational opportunities. So with Dr. Bob McClellan, we're creating a new course at TBI on climate and health, working on a longitudinal curriculum for our Geisel students, looking at where we can have interprofessional collaborations, um, actually working on a dual degree with uh, Thayer School of Engineering, so all of these great engineers can work with our uh, medical students to help them have uh, an idea of how to tackle these things. And um, even reaching out to the community, we had a six-part series for community members on health and climate. Um, we are also working closely with our uh, hospital institution. Uh, if any of you have heard of President Biden's uh, healthcare sector climate pledge, um, I hear rumors that it's actually been signed by the HMC that we will be 50% decrease in carbon emissions by 2030 and net zero institution by 2050, which is huge, very exciting. Um, so I also helped to found uh, an alliance for climate and health at Dartmouth. Uh, and really this is, again, to bring people together with these um, four pillars as our um, primary uh, goals of what we're trying to address. So in education, again, trying to create collaborations both for our students and for current healthcare professionals um, addressing sustainability within the healthcare sector. So uh, healthcare systems in the US produce eight to 10% of carbon emissions. So we need to tackle carbon emissions as a, a, a major part of what we're doing as healthcare providers. Uh, we are hearing lots of great research and we wanna support uh, research that addresses climate and health. And again, bringing people together is a big part of that. Uh, and finally, you know, looking at uh, advocacy and policy. And one of the great things about being a physician is that we do have a trusted voice in the community and uh, a great role for healthcare providers to really advocate, you know, for their individual patients. So these aren't future problems that we're seeing. These are things that, you know, I'm taking care of heat stroke in the emergency department. We're seeing increased asthma exacerbations in children on high heat days. We know that this is affecting our population now. It's not a future problem. And we need to come together to really speak out and advocate for um, healthy populations and healthy um, communities. So we uh, invite everyone and anyone across this campus to get involved. Again, collaboration, I think, is our key to our success. So we invite you to join our Alliance for Climate and Health. Um, also highlighting one of our leaders for the Med Students for Sustainable Futures is here, um, Kaylee Smolin. Um, grateful for her great work in this field. Uh, and then also highlighting one of the great community organizations that we partner with, uh, New Hampshire Healthcare Workers for Climate Action. And if you visit their website, an incredible wealth of information that you can access in terms of upcoming educational events, recorded webinars, uh, really great work being done by this community partner. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me. My name is Suresh, and I'm an assistant professor of computer science in the Department of Computer uh, in, well, in the Department of Computer Science. I work on uh, machine learning and natural language processing, and its applications to, or their applications to, socio-political and biomedical problems. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about a project in our lab that may be of interest to everyone here. We are looking at message receptivity, and uh, whether machine learning can be used to increase message receptivity for 
uh, important uh, issues of uh, social important issues. And so the idea here is uh, we want to create an AI assisted hardware management system. That's the gist of what we are doing. So what does that mean? Um, currently, I'm not sure why this thing uh, is over there, it should be down there, but uh, uh, currently if you're trying to uh, promote a particular issue that is uh, important to you, uh, you uh, may be uh, utilizing digital platforms where you compose a, a digital message and the digital message could be text, video, images, anything. And then you send it out, let's say on Twitter or something, and certain people on uh, that social media platforms are going to uh, see your message. Some of them are going to engage with it and some are not going to engage with it. This is basically what's happening right now. So uh, we are trying to improve this, uh, 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 this, uh, uh, this process using machine learning. And uh, the way we do this is uh, we work on natural language processing models that can take a message and automatically divide it into its content. This is the kind of the information carrying part of the message and the style, which is how the message is being delivered. So uh, to give you an uh, example, you know, if, if you have two messages, uh, the one on the top, you know, climate change is to habitat loss and extinction of many species. We can ensure the survival of many species by fighting climate change. If you look at that, the core message of these, uh, the core content is the same. It's about the effect of uh, climate change on uh, survival of, of species, but how it's being delivered is, is a little bit different. So the first message is uh, uh, basically uh, relying on sadness and anger uh, to get people to uh, uh, act. The second message is more about hope, but the core content again is the same. And um, similarly, oh, so uh, uh, what we're doing is uh, in our models, we're trying to basically automatically separate content from style so that we can lock the content of a message, what the core <coughs> message is, uh, but we can play around with the style. So we can actually change the style uh, to increase the receptivity or mes message receptivity for that particular uh, content. Similarly, we can uh, uh, look at our audience on Twitter and other social media platforms and use machine learning models to uh, characterize them based on their demographics and psychographics, so personality and demographics. So this we can do automatically using natural language processing. Similarly, we can do uh, something like this using machine learning. So then once we have done this, we can uh, put it all together and see whether uh, controlling for the actual content of the message, whether different styles of communication uh, and, and, and different uh, characteristics of the users can be used to predict engagement with the content. So can we predict how people are going to engage with a particular message based on its style and uh, the characteristics of the audience for that message? The answer, the preliminary answer, the results say yes, we could do that. We could actually predict engagement uh, using style and demographics and psychographics. Then we use this to create our AI-assisted uh, targeted messaging system. The idea is that our, our, our AI system will allow you to basically specify some content that you're interested in uh, uh, you know, sharing. So for instance, the, uh, uh, the content I, the message I showed you as an example with respect to uh, climate change and its effect on uh, survival of species. So you, you specify that and you specify your target audience. So like who is your target audience demographically and psychographically, and then our model will automatically generate different versions of the same message, uh, so the content is locked, but with different style, so that um, uh, you get the maximum engagement from that particular target uh, demographic. As you can imagine, this would be really uh, uh, helpful for uh, trying to get people to engage with issues that are of you know, social importance. So climate change is of course uh, a, a really good example. Uh, my lab has done work also on uh, political polarity. So for example, getting uh, people on the left to engage with ideas from the right and vice versa. So again, you keep the content uh, of your articles the same and the model will automatically generate different versions of an article so that you know uh, someone on the right will engage with it and someone on the left will also engage with it. This is to make sure that uh, uh, you know uh, we, we don't have these uh, echo chambers. Um, and um, yeah, I think uh, this is it. Uh, thank you.
Ms. Perry Wong. I'm a third year PhD student working with Professor Fionnelli at Beer School. Uh, I am so honored today uh, to be on her behalf to talk about the ongoing research in Everlab, which is essentially about the development of uh, novel functional electrochemical materials for energy and sustainability. Um, the uh, advancement of battery technologies has played an essential role in mitigating greenhouse gas emissions and tackling climate change. However, as we are transitioning from uh, conventional energy to the power of lithium batteries, uh, the relatively limited lithium resources plus the soaring of raw lithium materials uh, could significantly slow down the progress of future electrification. Uh, so here, beyond lithium ion technologies, our group uh, go one step further to develop rechargeable sodium batteries, because sodium is much more uh, abundant, cheap, and environmentally benign, as opposed to its lithium counterparts. Also, sodium batteries are very promising for uh, grid scale energy storage, especially when combined with other renewables like wind or solar. Um, another research thrust in our lab would be uh, developing solid state battery electrolytes to replace the commercial flame ball liquid electrolytes, uh, which can not only eliminate the safety concerns like battery fires or explosions, but can also uh, significantly enhance the energy density of battery cells. Um, moreover, uh, you know, the current commercially available lithium batteries can probably <coughs> work under minus 20 degrees Celsius, uh, while other group have developed the new battery chemistries that can sustain uh, extreme cold environments down to minus 80 degrees Celsius, which is uh, perfectly capable of performing uh, military or space applications. Uh, also, we are now providing other low temperature battery solution to help the uh, Arctic fishing community to uh, transition from fossil fuels to greener battery energy storage. Well, um, in addition to the uh, advances in batteries, we also put a lot of effort into uh, uh, developing novel catalysts to electrochemically reduce CO2 into fuels or other value-added chemicals, uh, which essentially creates a circular pathway for the uh, cycling or recycling of the uh, combustion products. So to uh, quickly sum up, we are adopting or essentially building on materials innovations in both battery technologies and electrochemical CO2 reduction to uh, further the journey toward a clean and sustainable future. And lastly, we would like to thank the generous support from the following institutions, uh, U.S. Air Force, NASA, CREL, NASA, Urban Institute, and the Air Department. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. So I, I'm actually going to do two talks here. So um, the first one is, is to do with uh, climate change itself. So I've been working on uh, snow, Kern, which is milkier snow and ice, for about the last 37 years, I think. Um, the project we currently have is, is looking at the effects of impurities on the deformation of ice, so it can feed into um, larger scale modeling of, of ice sheets. And so in particular, what we're interested in is sulfuric acid. And, and, and sulfuric acid actually um, is, is produced in a number of different ways, as indicated here. Um, it's produced sulfur, which is then oxidized, and the sulfuric acid produced then um, is, uh, comes back to Earth as, as in either rain or snow. And so we have a, a number of questions uh, related to that about how the uh, impurities, in, in particular sulfuric acid, um, uh, affects the strength of the ice, um, how it affects the, 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 the change in the, the grain size in the ice, and how it affects the, um, the crystallization process in, in the ice. And so this is just an example of, of what we're doing. We're also testing ice cores, with samples from ice cores as well. So this is um, just an example of the sort of thing we're doing. Um, we're making um, samples, in this case, between uh, high purity ice in the lab, uh, sulfuric acid doped ice, we're putting sulfuric acid just on the boundaries of the ice and having pure grains, and having uh, grains with sulfuric acid doped and, and have pure grain boundaries. 
And it's a matter, in short, of sulfuric acid. It's only of the order of a few ppm. Um, while that may seem a very small amount, it's been shown in the past by us that uh, uh, of the order of a ppm of, of uh, sulfuric acid in a single crystal device can, can change the strength by about a factor of three. So it's really dramatic now, a very small effect. And so this is the sort of thing we do. We do uh, compression testing. This one is also over here. You can see the blue line is a um, high purity ice. And when you put sulfuric acid in, it actually softens the ice really quite dramatically. So the effect of impurities in ice um, uh, are really dramatic effects. They also have a dramatic effect in light structure. So these colored images you see here are optical micrographs of thin sections of ice showing the grain structure. The, the one on the top left is this um, um, uh, as, as starting material. And these others are after the base mass detonation. And, and they're ones with, um, actually the bottom of the slide's been cut off. But, but they're, um, they're, they're either doped or, or undoped ice. And you can see the microstructure you get after uh, doping them and straining them uh, changes quite dramatically. So that also has an effect on the properties. So, so our goal here is really to, to uh, come up with the flow laws for, for ice and the effect of the impurity on them. We're also looking at the, the effect of the, uh, the stress state as well. Rather than simply doing compression, we're also doing shear testing. So uh, my, the second talk is, is actually to do with uh, issues to do with uh, uh, energy. And this is work with uh, uh, Jeff Hotier, who's um, also uh, in, the, in the engineering school. Okay, so um, one, of the, one of the issues I'm sure many people are aware of is that uh, there's, a, uh, there's a real increase in the number of electric cars and wind turbines and, and that requires permanent magnets for both of those. So a typical, uh, something like a Toyota Prius, which is not an electric, but a hybrid, has about five kilograms of, of magnet in there. And a large wind turbine, turbine has about 250 kilograms of magnet. So most of, those, most of those magnets are rare earth magnets, and they contain elements like uh, um, uh, neodymium and samarium, and others like dysprosium. Um, which are uh, uh, expensive and also they're environmentally really bad because uh, rare earths, contrary to the name, are actually not that rare, but they have a, they're, they're all of them in very low concentrations, and so it, uh, it's um, the process on them is uh, generally leads to a lot of environmental issues. The other big issue is that nearly all rare earths, and we know there's about 95 percent, actually come from China, so there's a strategic issue there as well. So one of the questions is, can we replace rare earth magnets? With, with, um, with something else. And um, so here's a couple of examples. So here's a couple of rare earth magnets. You can see the, the properties. And the way we measure the properties is this uh, parameter here, which is called the energy product. And you can see the, the, the high values you have for these two. Um, well, there's some other materials out there that could possibly um, uh, compete with those. One is simply nickel iron, 50-50 nickel iron. And another one is uh, uh, manganese aluminum. And um, certainly nickel iron has a, a property, potential properties as good as the rare earth magnets. And if you look at the cost per, per unit energy product, you can see these things would also be a lot cheaper as well. So there's a lot of advantages to, to using these materials. So slide you go down, please. Okay, thank you. So we, we currently have two uh, different uh, funded projects here. Um, one on the uh, processing of these um, these uh, tau magnesium aluminum magnets. This is what the, the crystal structure looks like. It's a really simple crystal structure. And, and this turns out to be a metastable phase. So one of the issues with making this is from a high temperature phase, which is an equilibrium phase, um, when you transform it at low temperature to metastable phase, you want to avoid making the equilibrium phases. Uh, and so we're, we're looking at how to manufacture this. And one of the ways is by this lab-based process here, where you can see there's a shielded material here. Um, a process called equal channel angle extrusion. And by uh, processing this way, you can actually improve the energy product. We're also looking at alloying the material as well to, to uh, improve the energy product. And, and um, uh, Jeff Ward's uh, involvement in this is that he does um, some quantum mechanical calculations with postdocs and graduate students. 
to, to understand what the effect those two new elements are on the, the, um, the transformation temperatures and the magnetic properties of the material. Um, the other project we're, we're working on, again, uses, oops, oops, sorry. Uh, uses uh, first principles quantum mechanical calculations to, um, to, to uh, again, um, try and understand the, the crystal structure material. Um, and and uh, we're also using a, a novel processing technique called electropulse annealing, where you actually use uh, pulses of electric current, very, very high current, um, uh, up to 1,000 amps, for very short pulses of time. So you heat and then and turn it off and then heat and turn it off. So you don't get too high temperature. Uh, in this system here, we're at um, nickel iron, um, at, at high temperature has this crystal structure, which is straight semi cubic, and at low temperature has this crystal structure here, um, which actually turns out, looks like a similar sort of structure, but now the nickel and iron here can be anywhere, whereas here they're actually in layers. And in fact, although this looks very different, it's actually the same crystal structure as this one over here, but just drawn in a different fashion. Um, and this only exists below 320 degrees centigrade. So the big problem here is that if you have a transformation that happens at such a low temperature, diffusion is actually very slow. And, and so we're, we're doing a number of things. We're looking at um, adding alanoid elements that can raise this transformation temperature, um, it incre increase the diffusion in the material. And we're also using this uh, process of electropulse annealing which can accelerate transformation sometimes by two orders of magnitude. And again, we're using quantum mechanical calculations to, to do that. So both these projects here are trying to make new magnets for, for um, a, a really uh, um, large market um, uh, which will um, uh, improve the energy usage in the future. End of that. Thanks for the chance to be here today. I'm Lauren Culler. I am in environmental studies and Arctic studies, and I'm an ecologist. I've been working in the Arctic and Greenland specifically, thinking about impacts of climate change on ecosystems. So the Arctic is warming, I think now it's four times faster than the rest of the globe. And as an ecologist, this is an interesting problem to think about because most of Earth's biodiversity and biomass are what we call exothermic organisms. So their body temperature fluctuates with the temperature of the environment. And as this happens, the rates of biochemical processes and biological processes change with temperature. So the way that organisms grow, survive, and reproduce in their environment is very fundamentally shaped by temperature change. So in Greenland, I work on issues of temperature variability, um, also variability in hydrology, which is linked to temperature change, on um, species abundance, biodiversity. I also do some work on biogeochemistry. So this picture here is from Greenland. That's the Greenland ice sheet in the background that we've heard a little bit about already today. And some freshwater ponds in the foreground. So we've done some research that's found that due to increases in temperature and changes in climate, um, those habitats are disappearing. And so what does that mean for um, carbon cycling? Some of these lakes also have a lot of cyanobacteria that are very understudied. So I was very excited to share Elijah's work today. Um, also, a big part of what I do in the Arctic is I work in biting insect systems. So this is an illustration from a recent paper we published. So mosquitoes and black flies, which everybody is familiar with, and then over on the right side is warble flies and bot flies. These are all really dominant pests in the Arctic that all require a vertebrate host at some point in their life stage, either to take a blood meal or the bot flies just lay their eggs under your skin. It's totally gross. Um, but my work looks at sort of these climate factors, so changes in temperature and precipitation on the life cycles of these organisms how they influence people and wildlife. They're really bad pests of caribou, and caribou, of course, are an extremely important resource for local economies and culturally all throughout the Arctic. So more insects, 
for caribou health and implications for communities. Then the last thing I wanted to talk about today, a really big part of what I do fits into the broader impacts and science diplomacy category. So in all the research that um, we do in the Arctic, a big part of it is education and outreach. So I am the PI on the Joint Science Education Project. So that engages uh, students at all levels in Arctic research, gets them learning how to work internationally and across cultures to tackle some of these big questions. I'm involved with the project to improve US Greenland research outcomes. There is so much research happening in Greenland right now. So many international scientists coming in and uh, thinking about what are the ways we need to behave when we're in Greenland and doing research. So we're developing some ethical guidelines for that. And then I have a grant from the State Department that kind of flips the research model. And so instead of going into Greenland and saying, I want to study XRZ, it's actually to develop relationships in communities and let those communities who are most impacted by climate change drive the research questions going forward. So thanks a lot. Um, great to be here. My name is Jonathan Winter. I'm a, an associate professor in the Department of Geography. And uh, my research currently really centers around climate projection uh, and then looking at the impacts of climate on various things that impact society. Uh, our group is almost exclusively computationally modeling based. So that's our methods. So in the upper left hand panel, you have uh, basically change in temperature over the last uh, 100 or so years. You have future projections of precipitation on the right. And what we're interested in is how these changes, either in past temperature or in future precipitation, or switch those around, uh, might impact some things that we care about. Uh, so my group works in three spaces right now. Uh, we work in northeast flooding, so there's been a large increase in the amount of heavy rainfall days in the northeast uh, over the past 30 or so years. Uh, so we're doing work now that links this increase in these heavy rainfall events uh, to actual impacts on the ground by looking at flood damage reports. So seeing like what types of storms actually cause flooding uh, that creates damage. Uh, we do a lot of work in the American Midwest on row crops. So that would be like corn, soy, wheat. We're particularly interested in irrigated systems. Uh, so looking forward and saying, okay, so the temperature increases, how is that gonna stress out plants? And then do we have the water uh, will we have the water in the future uh, to supply plants like we have today? Uh, and if not, what kind of yield reductions uh, do we have? And I'm glad Lauren went into the uh, uh, kind of more uh, disgusting aspects of our work. Uh, we also work on ticks uh, and Lyme disease. Uh, so we're very interested in how uh, climate and changes in land use drives the expansion of uh, ticks in the Northeast, and then the emergence of new diseases. So that would be Lyme disease out West, and then some diseases here, uh, like uh, anaplasmosis and babesiosis. And then uh, a project that I wanna highlight that we're spinning up right now that I think is really interesting, uh, and I'm, 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 I'm most excited about, uh, is looking at this trade-off in land use in the American Midwest between agriculture uh, and renewable energy generation. Uh, so my group has a long-standing work I was mentioning in kind of looking at agriculture, so changes in temperature, changes in precipitation, uh, which you can see in the upper two panels, uh, and then how that is uh, translated into change in yields, so how much food we can grow. So you'll see there are a couple areas here where we have, uh, you know, red, so these are areas where we're losing yields in the future, uh, and green would be areas that are actually getting better for yield uh, because we have a longer growing season. Um, and so the question becomes for those red areas, what, would, what should we be using that land for? Uh, is it worth growing food there anymore or should we shift to food production uh, and maybe put photovoltaics there or wind power or possibly it's a blend of the two because uh, you can basically intersperse agriculture and, and photovoltaics and agrivoltaics. And yeah, that's my work.
Hi, everyone. I'm, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm Matthew Bollingham. I'm in the Department of Earth Sciences, and I'm interested in glaciers and ice sheets around the world. I'm interested in um, understanding how they move, why they move, and how they are changing with climate change. So, um, IPCC report after IPCC report, they are highlighted as the biggest question mark when it comes to sea level rise. We know sea level is going to rise because of multiple reasons, but how fast the ice sheets are going to continue to respond to climate change is the biggest uncertainty. And so my work is generally focused on this question of how do we go about reducing this uncertainty because it's going to affect millions of people around the world. So it goes from developing better, more accurate um, numerical models. It goes um, also, a, a, a big part of my work has been uh, focusing on what is the topography like under the ice because it has a very big influence on the stability and vulnerability um, of the ice sheets in a changing climate. So uh, basically when it comes to can we make projections about how they're going to respond over the next century or centuries, this work uh, has two parts. There is the Heimkast, I'm not sure why it's not running, let's see, if, oh. Well, this is supposed to be a movie, I'm not sure why it's not running. Are you able to like, turn, put the movie on? It's not right otherwise. Uh, that wasn't me, but it's okay. So uh, a big portion of the work is what we call the hindcast. So instead of going straight into projecting the future, we look at whether the models are able to reproduce the past over the historical period. Are the glaciers retreating as we're seeing them retreat? Are they thinning? Are they accelerating? And if we have confidence that we can reproduce the past decades, then we have some you know, confidence in these models that they can do a good job at projecting the future. So Heimkast is a big part of this work, uh, of my work and the work of my group, where we use all the observations we can get to improve our understanding of ice dynamics, of the processes that drive how they respond to climate change. And then the forecast part is, now that we know how they work, now that we know that we have the right physics, we use uh, forcings from climate models, so future temperature, future uh, precipitation scenarios, and we move these models forward in time and see what, how much we're, we're losing, how much ice we're losing, and where. So when um, I was told that it would be good to talk about the next challenges, I think what I've, what I've done so far is mostly one way. What is the, how is the climate affecting the ice sheets? And we haven't really looked at this point too, so much into, too much into how are the ice sheets affecting climate in, you know, in turn. And we know it's a two way, you know, it's, the climate system has a lot of uh, moving, interacting pieces. And we know that ice melts, and when it melts, that puts a lot of fresh water into the ocean that could affect um, oceanic currents. You know that, for example, the Atlantic um, Meridional Overturning Circulation is, is keeping Europe warm. If we're dumping a lot of fresh water, that may change the thermal hairline circulation, that may change uh, you know, temperatures around the world, and we're already seeing uh, you know, changes at this point. Big changes in biogeochemistry, in where nutrients are. Again, if you put a lot of fresh water in the ocean, this uh, water being fresh will be at the surface and may prevent nutrients that may be at depth from rising and feeding you know, for fisheries or plankton and other things. It will have a big effect. The color of the earth, of course, if we have, you know, it's a nice reflective blanket of ice. If it retreats, we're changing the ability of the earth to reflect incoming sunlight radiation. And of course, local ecosystems, local populations that rely on the presence of the ice sheets uh, for hunting, for for fisheries um, and other things are affected by that. So looking at the two-way coupling is an important next step. That's all I have. for what the future may hold. I do believe that archaeological information combined with uh, past environmental information uh, can offer some insights and clues some contexts for what uh, different environments might look like in the future and how people might adapt to those changes as we go forward in uh, a warming world under various scenarios. So 
my current research uh, that I'm absolutely fascinated by takes place here in northern New England. And as many of you might know, northern New England, uh, at the end of the last ice age, would have resembled a climate or would have resembled an environment that looked a lot more like the Arctic uh, than it does now. Uh, I often ask my audiences when I talk about this to, to think about this place before it was here, when it was a, a different world, really. Um, and at the end of that Pleistocene Holocene transition, um, marked by the, the red line about 11,700 years ago, we see some pretty profound changes in the environment here. Um, we see uh, a shift from open environments, perhaps a spruce, uh, an open spruce parkland in, in the south, um, and in the further north, northern regions and at higher altitudes, probably a completely treeless country. Um, and in fact, we infer that there were migratory herds of caribou that inhabited these environments that were uh, fundamental to the, uh, uh, to the life ways of people that lived here at that time. Um, it's not there. Um, it is weird. So here you can see uh, a paleoenvironmental reconstruction from Nob Hill, Vermont, um, or a pollen, uh, pollen curves, excuse me, uh, this afforestation uh, period here when the, the, this open environment was shifting to a more treed environment. Um, and then uh, the Greenland temperature anomaly here, which is what I've been the most interested in. Um, so this is the end of the period called the Younger Dryas. A lot, of, a lot of archaeological work has talked about the beginning of the Younger Dryas here and how fast it was and how, bad, how hard that would have been on human populations. Very little has looked at the end, which was equally fast um, and probably posed its own specific set of challenges. Um, so here in northern New England, um, the, in the archaeological record, see these are some probability distributions of radio carbon dates. After the Younger Dryas, they become quite infrequent. And in fact, there does appear to be, right now, a radiocarbon date hiatus, but that's questionable. Uh, we also see transformations in technologies, um, going from these very distinctive fluted points. I'll zoom in on that. Um, very challenging to manufacture, made on very high quality uh, lithic raw materials, the stone that the, these folks chose to make them from. Uh, but following this hiatus, um, these transform, and uh, the fluting technology seems to vanish from the archaeological record. Um, and the stones that folks were, were using uh, also seem to change, which points toward changes in how people were using the landscape and the resources that they were choosing to focus on across that landscape. So moving forward, this research, a big thing that, uh, a big challenge that my team and I, or the team that I'm working with, wish to address is what is actually going on here? What happened after the Pleistocene Holocene transition and this ostensible temperature rise? Um, certainly, the temperature rose significantly in Greenland, but what were the temporal lags uh, between these terrestrial ecosystems here and the actual Greenland ice sheet. And we hope to gather more data on that uh, to try to understand how, uh, how quickly these landscapes transform and, uh, uh, and then uh, relate that to people. So with that, thank you. So uh, I'll say a few words that uh, my collaborators and I have been doing on uh, applying techniques from the theory of dynamical systems, which is the branch of mathematics that studies time evolving phenomena and data science to study uh, climate dynamics. So we're interested in particular in extracting uh, coherent patterns, uh, coherent patterns in the climate and forecasting them. So this is um, um, just a snippet of an example uh, of our work where we studied, um, uh, we developed techniques for uh, identifying uh, the El Nino phenomenon from uh, climatic uh, data sets. So th this analysis in particular is uh, from a simulation, from a simulation uh, of a climate model where uh, we take as inputs um, uh, sea surface temperature uh, data and um, we pass it through uh, an analysis technique that um, in a nutshell, what it does, it does a spectral analysis of, of, the, of, the, of this time series of, of sea surface temperature data. By that, I mean, um, sort of like in a uh, rough analogy, you can think of a, a dynamical system, like in this case, the, the Earth climate system, as possessing a, um, a spectrum, which is analogous to, say, the tones that a musical instrument might, might, uh, might generate. 
and uh, the spectrum of a dynamical system allows one to identify in an objective manner uh, persistent and coherent, coherent cycles, uh, and the El Nino phenomenon being, being uh, one of them. So here we kind of like um, obtain through our approach some um, uh, index for, for, for the El Nino that is shown in, in this uh, sort of like a, a time series trajectory that allows us to identify and uh, predict the different phases uh, of the phenomenon with an improved accuracy over um, uh, conventional, conventional uh, approaches. Now, the uh, the area that we are sort of like interested uh, to uh, continue uh, in this direction is to uh, use uh, similar uh, techniques to, uh, to delineate basically uh, the natural variability uh, of the climate from a forced response, either to natural or uh, anthropogenic, uh, anthropogenic uh, forcings. So um, this is an example from, uh, from our, our current work where um, we're using this kind of like spectral analysis uh, approaches to identify uh, climate change trends from uh, sea surface temperature data. So this is this blue time series here shows um, sort of like what our method sort of perceives as the climate change trend in the last, uh, um, I guess, uh, 40 or so, 40 or so years, plotted uh, uh, um, in conjunction with the global sea surface air temperature uh, anomaly data. Um, and moreover, what we're also interested in is studying what are the effects of, um, of uh, this type of um, non-stationary trends to cycles of the climate, like the seasonal cycles. This is a, a, an example of um, one of these patterns that allows us to, um, to make um, some assessment of how the seasonal cycle is responding to the climate change, which, which has uh, implications to um, several socioeconomic uh, aspects. So um, yeah, that's what I, I have to say for today. Thank you very much. All right, folks, thank you. I'm Eric Osterberg. I'm a climatologist in the Earth Science Department, and I study mostly the atmosphere, so I look at temperature and precipitation uh, and its effects on uh, things like glaciers and ice sheets that we just heard about from Machio, and then about impacts on people, including human health, some of the things that John Winter mentioned. Um, and if you, a lot of my work focuses on the last sort of several hundred years to the last few thousand years, because this is a time period when we went from natural climate variability to now human dominated climate change and so understanding that transition and if you remember in the late 90s we had the um the famous michael mann hockey stick curve come out where temperature sort of wiggled for a thousand years and then you get the blade of the hockey stick going up showing human warming and so a lot of our work is sort of finding other versions of the, that hockey stick whether it's in precipitation or it's in temperature or it's in pollution and not just finding them but understanding them so uh, a couple examples here I'm showing at the top is uh, extreme rainfall that uh, John Winter was talking about. Uh, and not just, again, documenting this, but understanding why, what kind of storms are changing to give us more extreme rainfall here in the Northeast. Is it more hurricanes? Is it more nor'easters? Are they happening more frequently? Are they more powerful? Are they moving slower? Are they just dropping more rain? So we understand that kind of stuff. Uh, looking at Greenland melt and, and not just that it's melting faster today than it has for centuries, but understanding why. And so a lot of this is sort of understanding the problem of climate change, but more and more of my uh, personal focus and more of my research focus is now turning towards solutions. And so this includes things like community organization. Uh, so I'm the, the chair of an organization called the Upper Valley Climate Adaptation Work Group. We work with local towns and nonprofits and businesses and concerned citizens to try and make the Upper Valley more resilient to climate change and to reduce emissions through mitigation. And so a lot of this is trying to communicate the science to non-scientists. And so I think a lot about scientific communication and scientific messaging. And I'm starting to get really concerned that we're screwing up the messaging as scientists. And we're leading a lot of people to hopelessness, particularly the young people, our students, are very uh, more and more hopeless about this. And this is one example of this. This is looking at global emissions going out to the end of the century. 
looking at high emission scenarios at the top. Whoops, can you go back one? Uh, yep, sorry. High emission scenarios at the top, and then of course medium and then low. These are like Paris targets. Almost to a person, our students assume or think that we are not just in this red, but like at the top of this red right now. Even though right now, we're actually down here, and actually with the Inflation Reduction Act, we're more like down here. And so if you think that you're up here, no matter what we do, that leads to hopelessness. That leads to inaction. When we want the opposite, we want action. So how do we walk this tightrope of conveying urgency without leading to inaction and hopelessness? How do we convey urgency that leads to agency and leads to positive action? And so I think a lot about this from a scientific perspective. I'd be interested to talk with anybody thinking about messaging and how you communicate that message in the digital world, uh, interactive world, in the policy space. Um, because this, this is a real problem. And I, I wonder, for example, why do we even continue to publish papers that have RPT 8.5 in them? It's not going to happen. Why do we keep talking about it? The IPCC says things like, if we don't act now on climate change by 2025, it's too late to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. So what are we gonna tell people in 2026? Don't bother? So these are the things I'm thinking about as a scientist, and I'd love to think about it more from a uh, more robustly research-focused, evidence-based perspective from social scientists, people who think about communication, think about psychology, think about how you motivate action. Thanks. I'm a gastroenterologist, um, and uh, I've been doing clinical research for the past 20 years, uh, and over the time it has bothered me how much waste we produce in endoscopy. Um, and so my focus uh, of my research time has changed a little bit from clinical studies to understanding the waste we produce and the environmental impact that we have. So in the United States, um, so, so in general, the idea is what, what's the contribution, or let's put it this way, Sarah mentioned that uh, healthcare has a major impact on the carbon footprint. Uh, it is um, producing about eight to 10% uh, of greenhouse gas emissions in the United States. And um, uh, the aspects in the healthcare system that are procedure heavy are probably major contributors. In the United States, we do about 18 million endoscopic procedures a year. Uh, Many of them are related, for instance, to colorectal cancer screening, colonoscopies. A and that goes along with producing a lot of waste. Uh, in fact, there are some data that suggests that endoscopy is the third uh, largest waste generator in the hospital setting. So this was our study that we did about two years ago. We just counted trash bags and weighed them. And we found out that in, we did this in three hospitals, Hitchcock, VA, and Elliott. We found out that per procedure, we produce about 2.1 kilograms of waste. So if you, if you uh, add those trash bags up to a soccer field, you cover about 117 soccer fields, one meter in depth. And the weight uh, represents uh, the equivalent weight of about 25,000 passenger cars. So we also, uh, with a push of um, um, reusable equipment to disposable equipment, particularly um, the idea that we use an endoscope only once and then throw it away and dispose of this. So there's a push of companies to, 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 um, to distribute um, endoscopes that can only be used once and then being disposed of. So with that push, we wanted to know if we adopted that, um, uh, that practice, uh, how much additional waste would we have? And the bottom line is we would increase our net waste by about 40%. So, um, Waste is just one component, uh, of course, and we don't know about the carbon footprint of our specialty or subspecialty, but waste is what we see uh, and has been increasingly irritating to many of my colleagues across the country. Um, and over the past two years, there has been an issue, um, a lot of efforts of trying to come together in, in, among the societies and uh, think about a strategic plan, how we can um, change our practice towards an environmentally sustainable practice. And um, we um, um, came up with a strategic plan over the next five years that covers seven domains, research, education, clinical practice, advocacy, 
industry into society and society, but that was actually going online yesterday in all four major society websites. So um, that is the current and just one final aspect about the future. Uh, we received a couple of grants to study the carbon footprint, not just waste and endoscopy. Um, we are engaged with an international group how to standardize that. Um, and um, that's what we need. We need students to help with this and also we need expertise, particularly related to material composition. So if anyone uh, is here to help with that, let me know. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Awesome, thanks. Um, thanks for having me. Um, it's, uh, I feel like I'm a little bit out of my element, but I'll try to convince you that there's an energy-related theme in our research. <laughs> so there's, this is sort of half of the work in my laboratory right now that I'm going to talk about. It's really current and forward-looking. Um, and so really, there's one big question we're trying to address right now. This is a hypothetical methane cycle on Mars on the left-hand side, which is really what I'm going to focus on. But I think there's a direct relevance to uh, the future of energy storage and reuse um, on this planet, focusing explicitly on uh, hydrogen storage and te storage technology. I'm a scientist, I'm not an engineer, but the questions that we try to understand as geochemists and microbiologists, specifically in the deep subsurface, have a lot of relevance both on other planets as well as here on Earth. So some of the NASA-funded research going on in my laboratory right now um, by a group of great grad students, Zhao Wen Li and Nisha Nathan, is trying to understand when you find a population of methane molecules on Earth or when NASA sends up our next billion dollar robot to Enceladus or Mars or, or wherever, if we find methane, how do we know if it's biologically generated or altered? Um, this is a huge question. This is essentially the search for life elsewhere in the universe, right, or elsewhere in our solar system explicitly. And so what we're trying to develop right now is a way to differentiate any population of methane molecules on Earth if they've been made or touched by biology. And that's what the plot on, the le on my left is. And so don't worry about the various isotope axes, but right now we're making pretty good headway. So every time I find some methane, I want to know if it's biologically made or geologically made. That's really what we're trying to do um, here on Earth, or excuse me, in the laboratory, um, with the intent of sending, again, you know, orbiters or rovers. Uh, what we're going to do uh, going forward here on Earth, or engineers are going to do, is try to pump huge quantities of hydrogen into Earth's subsurface, into salt caverns. Um, what I can tell you is hydrogen is a delicious food for microorganisms. As soon as you put it down there, they're going to start to eat it if it's below a certain temperature pressure threshold. And so a lot of that's going to get directly converted into methane if it's under the right circumstances. And again, our isotopic tool is a great tracer for the efficiency with which they're doing that process and or if you want to protect your hydrogen when you're storing it, we could tell you how much activity in principle is going on just by taking samples at the surface where it's a lot easier to make measurements. Um, so those are sort of the two hydrogen methane related projects going on in my life. So thank you. Mayfield. I'm an assistant professor of engineering in the Thayer School. I am, however, an interdisciplinary researcher really focused on problems and leveraging any type of, of modeling framework to solve problems in terms of how do we mitigate emissions and the impacts associated with climate change. So my lab focuses on three main areas of research. The first is energy system modeling and infrastructure planning. So how do we deploy different types of infrastructure in the future to mitigate emissions? And the second main area of research is what are the impacts of our techno technological decisions regarding uh, emissions reduction? So what are the social equity implications, the environmental and socioeconomic in impacts associated with our decisions regarding technology? And the third area is focused on stakeholder planning and policy processes. 
So I'll give a couple brief examples of research in each of these areas. So the first area in energy systems modeling and infrastructure planning, uh, this is an example of some of the work we did in creating algorithms of how uh, we can deploy infrastructure. And here this looks at deployment of uh, wind, which is in blue, transmission, which are the, the veins in white, and then you can see utility scale solar in uh, orange, right? And so this is a snapshot in 2020. This is a potential snapshot in 2050 if we're going to meet a net zero target by, by the year 2050. So this is in a, even not even a high renewables case, right? So there's gonna be a lot of impacts associated with those decisions and it's not purely economic and technological decisions, rather it's a multi-objective problem. So in our modeling, we integrate both kind of land use, social equity, ec economics, politics, labor, air quality, all different types of impacts in how we model our, our system going forward. Not just the impacts of our technological decisions, but how they will influence our, our decisions regarding technology and infrastructure. And second main area, we do impact assessment. And so this is an, just an example from some work we did looking at kind of the phase out uh, of coal and the socio associated uh, air pollution related uh, benefits, right? And we also do impact modeling related to labor and, and, and other types of impacts as well. And then the third main area, which is kind of a very large focus of, of what we do is integrating kind of stakeholder preferences and understandings into our modeling frameworks. And so that includes kind of explicit kind of public surveys and expert elicitations, but also kind of policy briefings and, and informing different stakeholders. Um, in addition to kind of working not just with community stakeholders and policymakers, but also doing technical consultations to ground our, our modeling framework in what's technologically actually feasible. And um, with that, uh, I look forward to kind of speaking to many of you on potential collaborations, given what we do is inherently very co collaborative and multidisciplinary. Thank you. The Earth gets so cold that the ocean freezes, forming sea ice. This sea ice covers a vast aerial extent of millions of square kilometers. It is just a thin veneer of ice only a couple of meters thick. And even though it's far away, it plays a critical role in global climate studies. It plays a critical role as an indicator of climate change. Think of it, you have this big ice cover that's very thin and can melt. And as an indicator of climate change, the story it tells is unequivocal. There is warming. In the past 40 years, the end of <clears throat> summer ice extent is only half of what it used to be. The Arctic sea ice cover is also an amplifier of climate change. It's an amplifier through the ice albedo feedback. The albedo is simply the fraction of incident sunlight that's reflected by a surface. And the ice albedo feedback is shown in these images here. We start off in the spring, snow covered sea ice, a great reflector, reflects 85% of the sunlight. But as we go in the summer, melting starts. Melting lowers the albedo, which means more sunlight is withdrawn, which means there's more melting, which means the albedo goes down even more, which leads to more melting. It's a positive feedback. And if you're doing a climate model, you have to get these positive feedbacks right. And what our group is interested in is first observing the changing Arctic sea ice cover and then understanding the drivers of these changes. And we do that through four broad categories of activities, through field experiments. Field experiments like participating in the larger international mosaic experiment where we froze an icebreaker to the ice and drifted for a year measuring everything we possibly could. But sadly, you can't be everywhere, every time, every place. And so that led to developing autonomous instruments, the next best thing to being there. 
We deploy ice mass balance buoys to keep track of ice growth and ice melt on the surface and the bottom and ice temperatures. And they're adaptable. We can put other sensors on them. We typically put out five to 10 per year. Then we want to scale these, in, these measurements up to put them in the context of the entire Arctic Ocean. And we do that through process modeling. <coughs> process modeling such as radial transfer, where we're looking at how sunlight interacts with the ice, how much is reflected, how much is absorbed, how much is transmitted, and how does that vary over space and time. And finally, we want to take all this information and integrate it into climate models. We have ongoing collaboration with researchers at the National Center for Atmospheric Research to get our results incorporated into the treatment of sea ice in the community or system model. And in all these activities, the approach is synthetic, bringing together different data sets, <laughs> interdisciplinary, working with researchers from different fields, and finally, highly collaborative. research focuses on looking at environmental exposure and respiratory health outcomes. And we look at a variety of respiratory health outcomes in individuals with diseases such as asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, cystic fibrosis, and infants with bronchiolitis. And the exposures that we look at are both outdoor and indoor exposures. Um, from an outdoor perspective, we look at both temperature, humidity, ozone exposures, and particulate matter exposures. And the way that we assess these is from direct measurements using gravimetric um, filter-based methods for PM and also modeled exposures based on geocoded address of study participants using land use model GIS um, and satellite imaging along with <coughs> regulatory monitors from the EPA. I also have an interest in indoor air pollution given that 90% of Americans spend um, the majority of their time indoors. Um, and including the indoor exposure, when we're talking about overall exposure, is very important when we consider um, all the health exposures that people um, can face. And in the indoor environment, we look particularly at particulate matter and nitrogen dioxide, given the unique sources in the indoor environment. And we look at laser counters or gravimetric-based methods to sample indoor environments and also have used some modeling exposures there. And when faced with the indoor environment, we look at both heating, cooking, and home behaviors that can increase um, indoor PM and NO2 exposures. And some examples of the work that we've done in this area in terms of indoor and outdoor exposure assessment and health outcomes are as follows. Looking at stove use and um, symptoms in children with asthma. Looking at interventions that can decrease home behaviors to decrease pollutants and subsequent health outcomes. Looking at association of modeled long-term ozone exposures and health outcomes in individuals with and at risk of COPD. And some of the work that we're continuing to do is identifying factors that make someone more susceptible to the health effects of um, air pollution exposures. We know, that, we know that there is an association between exposure and health outcomes, and now the goal is to see who may be more susceptible or vulnerable, so we can focus limited resources on those populations. And we can look at both individual and neighborhood characteristics that may confer increased vulnerability to such, ex such exposures or may act as independent exposures in themselves. And we look at these factors both as covariates and effect modifiers in our statistical models. And as I mentioned, as independent predictors. And a focus here that, that is of interest to our group here is looking at morality as an independent exposure for health outcomes related to air pollution exposures or as an effect modifier. And some work in this arena that we've done is looking at neighborhood poverty as an effect modifier for the association between ozone exposure and health outcomes. And also looking at racial segregation and that relationship to COPD outcomes. And looking at rural residents um, as an independent risk factor, even when accounting for other factors associated with COPD prevalence. 
And um, a certain part of that I have is looking at biochemical properties of mucus parents, to determine whether those with impaired mucus parents may be more susceptible to those excess particles and gas air pollution. So thank you for your time, and I'm happy to connect with you. So good morning, uh, pleasure to be here. Um, my basic messages to you are, that I will try to briefly substantiate, are that uh, fuels from plants you can't eat are a very important part of a transition to a sustainable world, probably more important than many people think they are, that we have uh, a globally leading group uh, in this area that is distinctively and perhaps uniquely broad. So uh, on the first point, uh, transportation is the largest uh, energy sector in terms of greenhouse gas emissions and the fastest growing worldwide. It's the most difficult to achieve emission reductions of all of the energy sectors. And about half of global transport emissions are unlikely to be provided by electricity or hydrogen according to the International Ag Energy Agency. Plant biomass is widely available at a purchase cost less than $100 a dry ton. If you translate that purchase cost into dollars per gigajoule, it's the equivalent of oil at $38 a barrel. So this stuff is uh, a cost-competitive raw material. Biomass is expected to provide more primary energy than wind and solar combined, according to the IPCC's 2050 scenarios. The primary reason is because of bioenergy with carbon capture and storage the need for negative emissions, and perennial inedible cellulosic feedstocks like grass and crop residues have the largest resource base and the most favorable attributes. Uh, of course, there's a large biofuel industry from corn and from sugarcane in the U.S., currently not economic from cellulosic biomass. Concerns are expressed over land competition, uh, and also the climate change mitigation logic has been challenged. And so, a, a sustainable biofuel supply chain needs to be cost efficient, carbon efficient, land efficient, demand responsive, poverty and development responsive, entrepreneurial, and needs philosophical framing. We are active in all of those areas uh, and have exciting in-progress activity. I'm just trying to show you the breadth of it. We could talk in more detail. And we basically work with people all over the world uh, on, on these topics. So I lead a large group at Dartmouth. I lead a lab at the University of Campinas in Brazil. Uh, I was initiated the Global Sustainable Bioenergy Initiative. I'm on my third startup company. And again, if you look at the institutions on the right-hand side, you'll see people from all over. So thank you very much. I don't tire of this subject easily, so if you want to talk about it later on, I'd love to talk to you. Hey everyone, so my name is Marissa Palusis. I'm an assistant professor in the Earth Science Department. Alright, and so the research that I do at Dartmouth is broadly focused on landscape evolution, uh, specifically Arctic landscapes and how they change under changing climate. And some of the work um, that I've been doing that I'm really excited about right now is basically trying to quantify the flux of sediment, water, and nutrients from steep mountainous terrain uh, in the Arctic. And in order to do this, um, and basically I'm trying to quantify these fluxes both in the modern and then compare that to uh, these rates in the past. And my group does this through a variety of ways. So we do a lot of field mapping uh, we try and go out and monitor active events. Uh, we do a lot of sampling. Uh, a lot of our work now is using remote sensing, so both from satellite imagery, but also data that we collect in the field. And then now looking more at um, data that's uh, recorded in things like lake records. 
Now, in order to sort of make this, uh, to take this data and put it in a more sort of mechanistic framework or a more quantitative framework that we can then apply to modeling, um, we've spent more time now uh, basically doing more instrumentation. So the goal is to, sort of broad goal is to, to measure changes in temperature um, and then be able to relate that to changes in these sediment, water, and nutrient fluxes. So this is an example of some of the work that we're actively doing right now, um, both in the Arctic as well as uh, just a little bit north in the White Mountains. And so we're making measurements with you know, small temperature sensors, also using, um, making temperature estimates with things like drones, which is a lot of fun. And then we're taking this data and applying it to physically based models. So in this case, this is a model that is looking at how uh, changes in surface temperature can affect the damage that occurs in, say, bedrock. And then the ultimate goal is to be able to put this into a, something like looking at sediment production. So we can then take these models and then we can then have a relationship between the rate at which, say, sediment is produced um, under uh, different temperature conditions. And so this is important because then uh, once we have these relationships, as I said, we can then put this into landscape evolution models. So as we have better and better predictions for how climate or temperature is gonna change in the Arctic, we can then sort of turn a dial and say, okay, what's gonna happen to our landscapes? Um, and that allows us to predict some of these, um, I don't know if I can do this, some of these uh, big, uh, you know, in this case, this is a big landslide failure that happened a few years back. So that's all, thank you. So I'm Alberto Quattrini Lee, Assistant Professor in the Computer Science Department and Co-Director of the Dartmouth and Reality and Robotics Lab. The problem that uh, we are looking at uh, are uh, involving exploring the pretty much the more than 80% of unexplored uh, water environment. And in particular, two of the main projects that I'm currently having uh, in the lab involve uh, one, monitoring the lakes, from some material blooms, and two, exploring the uh, underwater world for uh, recording uh, archaeological sites. Uh, so for example, shipwrecks. And so we are trying to do this uh, by using artificial intelligence and robotics, really try to scale up, right, so on uh, this effort. And so these are uh, really interdisciplinary uh, problems, right, so that uh, involves, well, our lab, right, so within the technology side, as well as uh, um, scientists, uh, for example, like, you know, from biology, environmental science, uh, archaeologists, right, so really to use this technology, right, so for a purpose. And so here, like, you know, are pretty much, like, you know, kind of a very uh, broad overview, right, so of these projects with the robots that uh, we have in the lab and uh, the places that we have been at, right, so to uh, collect this data. Now, like, you know, how do we achieve uh, right, so this problem? So some of the main challenges in having the robots uh, being applied in this type of environment is the fact that uh, underwater, we don't have GPS. We don't have, like, you know, Wi-Fi. So, like, you know, the uh, comfort that we have, right, so in using our phone and connecting via Wi-Fi, right, so it's not present there. And so, really, our goal, right, is to build a low-cost uh, technology that can operate, right, so in this uh, wild environment. And in particular, then we, it means that we look at right, so the full stack autonomy right, so of this robot. Uh, so one, uh, where the robot is, or uh, like, you know, how the world looks like. And so we try to develop technology right, so that uses camera, uh, perhaps like, you know, acoustic devices, maybe like, you know, light-based devices. Right? So to be able to uh, understand where the robot is and how the world looks like. And so here are some examples like in a cave that we have been at with the underwater robot or over the collar. Then, like, you know, having that representation allows the robot to really plan, right, so, and take decisions. One, like, you know, really just to be safe, right, so itself and uh, with the respect of the other environment, so avoiding obstacles. And we were able, like, you know, to do some experiments in, con in the Connecticut River and really see, right, so whether we had the self-driving capability. 
And two, like, you know, really to drive the robot, right, so to collect the information that is going to be usable, right, so by biologists, archaeologists, and so on. And so clearly, to scale up, we need also to have, like, you know, multiple robots. And so that means that, uh, well, at least if you wanted to make them more intelligent, they would need to communicate. Uh, and so we have been trying to develop right, so techniques that are, uh, and devices, right, so that allow the robots right, so to communicate despite the absence right, so of that Wi-Fi that we are used to. By using light, by using, uh, you know, uh, selective strategies, right, so to communication. And so all of this to support, right, so to have a technology for the environment. And so really here, I saw pretty much some of the pictures uh, of like, you know, deployments that we have been at uh, over the last few years. So feel free to reach out. Thank you very much. Coming. I don't have slides um, because I thought that only four minutes, so I would just say a few words like this. Uh, I'm involved in two projects that deal with energy. So in four minutes, I'll talk two minutes about each, more or less. Uh, the, the first one is uh, aviation fuel uh, that will be renewable. Uh, I have a company called E2Fuel, that means electricity to fuel. And we do respect to the people who use biomass to make biofuels. Uh, I propose a different path, and that is to start with electricity as the, uh, the source of energy rather than the biomass. So the idea is that uh, we have a lot of PV cells and so forth on roofs, and uh, we will not need then um, fields and so forth to, to grow biomass, and we simply collect electrons uh, at times when it is abundant uh, sunshine and too much electricity, so it's pretty cheap, so the idea is to harvest uh, electricity when it's too cheap, or even at times and places where they'll pay you to take the electricity that they cannot use. Right? And so the idea is that you start with very free to zero cost energy, the E, uh, the electrons, and then what you do with that, uh, through electrolysis, we generate H2, hydrogen. And that's the first step on the way to make a hydrocarbon that will be the, the fuel for the airplane. Now, yeah, why, why that instead of the electricity on, on airplanes is because uh, electrical planes are never going to fly. It would be just too heavy. The only way to carry uh, not a lot of energy with little weight on board of an airplane is the liquid fuel. You just want it to be renewable. And so you, you've got the H2 now. If you take some sequestered CO2 or CO2 that we capture from some of the process like uh, cement uh, making or maybe even uh, fermentation of grapes to make wine, wh whatever is a good source of CO2. Uh, you uh, put that in your water too, so now you have your hydrogen, you have your carbon, then you can make your hydrocarbon and that's where the secret comes in. I'm not gonna reveal the secret, but uh, from H2 and CO2 dissolved in water, the energy of the H2 is able to make uh, methanol. Uh, and then from methanol you can make uh, dimethyl ether, which is a good diesel fuel, so you could use that uh, in trucks, or you could also uh, do something like kerosene, which is very close to aviation fuel. So that's the idea. We start uh, from uh, electricity rather than then biomass go on the field to do a renewable fuel. The catch is to have seed that is not from fossil origin. Yeah. And then when that uh, fuel is uh, uh, combusted on board of the airplane, it becomes CO2, but it's not a new CO2, so that uh, we don't worry about that. That's a contribution to climate change. So that's number one. The other uh, project is very different. It has to do with the energy efficiency of drones. Uh, you all have seen drones that are very common and so forth. Uh, you've seen those quadcopters with uh, four propellers or exocopters with six. Right? These are extremely inefficient. They need a lot of energy just to stay aloft, to, to create their own lift. And more than that, uh, the Reynolds number at which the blades turn, that's a question of mechanics, uh, puts them in a very bad range in terms of efficiency of the airport dynamics. So uh, you have a double penalty with the drones the way we have them. And so my idea is to uh, do better especially when distance matters. So I'm thinking here of uh, last mile delivery by uh, outfits like Amazon, 
Walmart or just what maybe uh, UPS and FedEx would want to have in addition to their delivery vans is to have a drone that would carry the package a few miles and back on a straight line up on the road. You don't need a driver, you save a lot of money. And the better drone would be a mechanical bird called an ornithopter. So I'm developing ornithopters as a substitute to the quadcopter or exocopter uh, drones to avoid uh, the energy efficiencies, the lack of efficiency of those drones. Keep in mind that uh, birds can migrate a thousand miles or something like that, which proves that this uh, is a great way to uh, cover distance at very low energy. Uh, birds, of course, have a fat engine. Uh, I cannot uh, replicate that, so I'll send out a little batteries. But my batteries would be only used for the thrust, not for the lift. Once uh, the bird flies on its own wing, it creates its own lift. And so I need a lot less energy to create just the, the thrust for the drone to go forward. And uh, the birds don't need a runway to land and to take off. You know, birds can land on a wire. So arriving at the destination, landing there uh, uh, on a non prepaid surface is, is perfectly fine. So I think I can solve some last mile delivery problems uh, in an energy efficient way by exploring, by developing a, uh, a mechanical bird, a replacement of the drone saving my today. And that's my story. I do other things, but I'm not going to do anything. about uh, a project that I'm in the middle of on re emergent imaginaries regenerative agriculture in the United States. Um, by imaginaries, I simply mean collective visions of desirable futures. Um, and these imaginaries matter in the world because they inform decisions, actions, and resource allocation. And in the past few years, um, uh, we've seen that imaginaries of regenerative agriculture as a solution to climate change have informed a lot of corporate sustainability initiatives, uh, commitments, I should say, which is something I've studied for several years, so you can see here a few examples, um, as well as a lot of uh, uh, policy decisions at different scales, as well as uh, some sort of um, investment firms. Um, so, um, what exactly do we mean by regenerative agriculture? And what does it have to do with climate change? Um, well, the basic practices involved of uh, cover cropping, reduced or no tillage, crop rotations, and so forth, um, can help, are thought to help with, uh, to mitigate climate change through soil um, carbon sequestration and to help farmers adapt to climate change by improving soil health. Um, but the ability of regenerative ag to do either of these things depends not only on a certain some scientific questions about how much the carbon soil can different kinds of soil can store for how long and other people can talk about that uh, and I think you will hear from some of them in a few minutes um, but also farmers willingness to actually adapt the practices and because of some of the upfront costs involved as well as the amount of learning curve the, the willingness of farmers to adopt these practices can't be assumed so what my postdocs and I are most are interested in are the questions of how are these, these visions of regenerative ag taking shape? How are different organizations, in particular big food and ag companies, trying to enroll farmers in those visions? And how are they being received? And so we're talking to a lot of the companies uh, that are promoting regenerative ag, either through their supply chains or through voluntary carbon markets that they've created, as well as to farmers primarily in the Great Plains and northern New England. Um, and one thing that we're finding, and again, we're only midway through, is that companies, while companies see uh, regenerative ag as good for business in a variety of ways, as a way to meet climate, Paris climate commitments, as a way to open up new markets, improve brand image, and not least increase their own resilience in the face of climate change, many company, or many farmers see uh, regenerative ag as a way to reduce their independence on uh, on companies' inputs and markets. So there's a distinct comp uh, sort of competing imaginaries going on there. 
One thing that means is that there's an intense competition right now among companies to enroll the relatively few sort of willing farmers in their carbon markets and regenerative ag programs. Um, and these are just a few examples of the, com of the companies that are, that are out there uh, that are wooing farmers. And this is likely to increase this competition um, with the, the Biden administration's uh, sort of pouring of a lot of federal funding into programs to promote climate, uh, climate smart, AKA regenerative agriculture. Um, so it's a very interesting time to be looking at this subject. Um, thank you. Can you hear me well? Mm -hmm. So, um, I'm like, I, I, I didn't see anybody from my department here, but I'm a cognitive neuroscientist. So the way I'm looking at climate change at Southern University is a bit different than what we, what other people do here. So my lab studies flexibility in learning and decision making, mm -hmm. trying to understand neural mechanisms by which we become flexible creatures we are, or when those, uh, when those mechanisms fail, uh, and when, and how. So over the past few years, I've become interested in understanding uh, oops, um, that uh, what these cognitive abilities that made us to be such a successful species also can make us to be uh, the unsustainable species we are. So we try to understand basically one of those aspects of cognitive uh, function that makes us unsustainable. and. Uh, so on the one hand, as I mentioned, we are successful, but also if you look at cognitive processes, you can see uh, um, in many places that we have tendency, we have cognitive biases and tendencies that may sound fine. You know, for example, we are risk averse, we avoid losses, et cetera, and we are part of who we are as humans, but they have actually, this, these tendencies can have great consequences in terms of sustainable behavior. So we try to understand basically the cost of these cognitive you know, biases and tendencies for the environment. So that's one way of looking at it. Uh, you know, depending on who we are, how unsustainable we are, and how we can do something about it or not, that's a different question. But you can also look at the question, we look at the question from a different point of view, which is what are the challenges to, uh, uh, um, to be sustainable? Uh, so on the, on the one hand, you can think about that uh, we, we fail in, in understanding or perceiving how our, our actions or choices are unsustainable. And so this could be a limitation in how we learn uh, or how we acquire knowledge, which could be, again, individual in terms of individual learning or based on social learning. So that's one aspect of it. And the other one is the, the difficulties we have in adopting sustainable behavior. Many of you here, uh, your research is focused on understanding solutions to be, to be more sustainable. But at the end, we need humans to adopt those solutions. And the question is that what are the, what are the difficulties there? So, uh, and you know, again, what aspects of our cognitive function uh, actually help us or stop us from being more sustainable? And so basically the overarching question that we try to address uh, and tackle uh, is that what are the, uh, how we can overcome barriers to sustainability uh, by better understanding human cognition. And um, for that, also I'm teaching a course. If, uh, if you have in, you know, students interested in this topic, uh, basically trying to uh, bring up the, the research and ideas together about the link between sustainable behavior and who we are uh, as a species. Thank you.
Thanks. Um, nice to meet everyone. Uh, I'm Chris Snyder from the Economics Department. Um, I'm going to begin not by talking about anything to do with climate, but I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm actually like Johnny come lightly to this topic, um, stuff I've done with another um, challenge to the species, and that is uh, pandemic and epidemic diseases. Um, so um, the, the title of this presentation is Designing an Advanced Market Commitment for Carbon Removal. But my work in this area actually started not on, on carbon removal, but on um, vaccines for diseases, and, uh, to start, uh, diseases of poor countries. Uh, there's a, a chronic undersupply of needed medicines to, to poor countries, and the point is that people in poor countries don't have a lot of income to, to pay for health care. Um, and a lot of it depends on donations from um, you know, like the Gates Foundation, donors, uh, advanced economies. Uh, there's missing markets for new products here. Why? Because the, the end consumers don't have the income. The altruistic donors may have the income they supply, the materials, but there's a limit to their altruism. Um, and things like patents, um, which give you know, pharmaceutical manufacturers usually incentives to innovate, when you're sort of doing bilateral negotiations with a donor whose, limit, whose altruism is limited, the donor's interested in economizing on costs, it doesn't lead to a very lucrative market. Um, and it's too bad because especially with new vaccines have, would have tremendous uh, social value there, um, you know, especially dedicated to diseases just of, of these uh, tropical or poor countries. So a solution was proposed by um, a co-author of mine. He went on to win the Nobel Prize in Economics, Mark Kramer, but not for work that he did with me, uh, you may say. The advanced market commitment. The idea is that um, you try to make the market more lucrative by um, putting together a subsidy fund pledged years in advance That'll top up a co-payment made by the made by the country. It'll incentivize R and D for uh, far far term project uh, products that uh, still need a lot of R and D or capacity for products that say have gone through clinical trials but um, need to be scaled up to deliver the enormous uh, capacity for um, the, the people in poor countries. So this was piloted um, with uh, a 1.5 billion dollar pilot AMC it was run for the pneumococcus vaccine. And it ran over 10 years, and it was credited with saving something like 700,000 children's lives. So I was part of the expert group um, that tried to evaluate the economics. Um, and together with the co-authors, we basically did a little bit of um, thought, like how, how would we have optimized this program if you know, knowing what we know now. Um, and we also worked on funding mechanisms for um, kind of related ideas for the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, so how does this relate to climate? Well, um, Nan, Nan Ranzahoff, um, who is the director of Stripe Climate, uh, Stripe is this fintech firm um, that has a climate division, of all things, um, noticed this work and said, well, wait a minute, maybe these ideas uh, for new technologies for, say, new vaccines for poor countries could be used for new technologies for climate, in particular carbon removal. Um, it's maybe controversial, but her belief is that if you look at the chart here, um, you know, even if you have reductions in emissions, we're still building up carbon in the atmosphere, and in order to get the, uh, these temperature goals, you're going to have to remove some of this. Now, there are a lot of offsets. There's a question about how high quality these offsets are. Right? There's an issue about durability of the offsets, and there's an issue about additionality. You might say, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save this tree from being cut down, but then you just cut down this other tree over there. That would be non-additionality. Durability is, you know, if you're sequestering carbon, is it just for 10 years, 100, or 1,000 years? Um, so the idea is that you know, there are going to be firms that are interested in you know, their net zero commitments. Many firms are going to be interested in honoring those with very low quality offsets. And the reason is they're cheap. You know, it might be a, uh, $20 a ton of CO2 or maybe even a dollar a ton of CO2. The cheaper they are, probably the lower quality. Maybe they're a bunch of conscientious firms that say, no, we want high quality offsets. You know, this actually durable carbon removal. Um, but the question, there's not really a market there because we don't know how many of these firms. It's just a voluntary market. How many of these firms are out there? So Nan's idea was, let's use this AMC idea, this advanced market commitment, to sort of pledge this, this market. They're gonna, there's going to be this fund to pledge. We wrote this um, op-ed in Politico calling for a billion dollars, nice round number, AMC. Well, Nan is a force of nature. She actually went out and raised that money, and now she's running this. It's called Frontier Climate. It's a, a billion dollar advanced market commitment um, that's going to... Uh, pledge to buy offtake agreements um, for, for technology. There's a question about, you know, what's the economics here? You know, how do you structure this? How much of the money should go toward sort of these infant uh, industries that are really high cost? $700 a ton. We want them to sort of march down their, their cost curve. 
And how much do you want to have more firm? You, you want the firms to eventually graduate to low cost carbon removal. How much of the money do you want to dedicate to the others? How do you want to structure it? That's the economics. Uh, so anyway, that's, uh, that's a bit about what I'm working on. ecosystems with a focus on soils. And so I'm, my research looks at whether soils are a friend or foe when it comes to climate change. And we've talked a lot, um, a lot of the talks, and just this one in past, of like carbon offset. Um, and one idea of this natural climate solution is to put more carbon into the soil. And there's a big question. I didn't know the term durability before the last talk, but it definitely applies. It's like, if we try to put more carbon into the soil through regenerative agriculture, for example, how durable will that carbon be in the face of climate change? So I do a lot of different things in terms of um, working with farmers on trying to get more carbon into their soil, but also looking at how soils respond to climate change. I'll focus on the response today. Let's see. Oh, you did tell me how to use this. It's a board of stuff that they can work with. Yeah, yeah, it's not. Um, can you forward it? Yep, now you should be able to. OK, thank you. So one idea is that soils already store a bunch of carbon for us. So they store 3,000 petagrams of carbon. That's 10 to the 15. Um, that's what a petagram is. And there's 800 petagrams in the atmosphere. So a big wild card question when it comes to climate change is as the soils warm, because they warm in pace with um, our warming climate, how much of that carbon could be released to the atmosphere? In the soils, um, the organic carbon is stored until microbes eat it, and then respire it as CO2. And as temperatures warm, microbial activity increases. So the idea is um, more of this carbon could end up going into the atmosphere as CO2, which would be a positive feedback to climate change. And again, there's people working on whether we can store more soils to help mitigate climate change. So it's really important to understand how vulnerable this soil carbon is to being lost to rising temperatures. Um, I'm going to show two studies here today. Uh, one in a coniferous forest soil in California, um, shown here, there. And then another, which is a tropical rainforest soil in Hawaii. So you can see these soils are very different in their color. They're different the amount of organic carbon they have. What they do have in common is that um, I did warming experiments where we warmed the whole soil profile um, to plus four degrees in the case of California and a range of temperatures in Hawaii and saw what happened to the soil carbon and whether there was increased CO2 loss to the atmosphere. So in California, we found that soil respiration at all depths in the soil profile um, increased in response to four degrees of warming. So that's what's predicted for California under a business as usual scenario. This was a surprise because there was some thinking that deeper soil um, wouldn't, soil carbon would not respond to climate change, and we show that it did. However, in Hawaii, where we had a very different soil, you saw how red it was. It has a lot of iron oxides and a lot of capacity to absorb organic carbon in a way that it is not very accessible to microbes. Where we had that, the soils did respond to warming at the surface, the top 20, the top 20 centimeters, um, and the top 40 centimeters saw an increase in soil respiration, that CO2 loss as a result of warming but the deeper depths did not respond to warming. So um, this is some good news in that this and other research I've done has shown where you have mineral associated organic carbon, so organic carbon that's absorbed to uh, minerals like iron oxide, they tend to be less climate sensitive um, than particulate organic carbon, which is not absorbed to minerals. And so we can take what we're learning here and sort of apply it to natural climate solutions. So I have a student who's doing a survey of 200 different farms in Vermont to figure out how much carbon is stored in these mineral associations, which would be more durable in the face of climate change, and whether management can affect that. So that's just some of what I'm doing, and I guess it's lunchtime. <laughs> Session. And as, as the last people walk in here, 
that you just opened up with uh, giving a short introduction to the person who is going to MC this afternoon and let our vice provost of research team at it. Can you not hear it? No? Closer? Yeah. 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 Okay, so I have, make, I have to make contact with my mask, I guess. So I would like to welcome Dean Madden, our Vice Provost of Research, who is here to MC this afternoon. He will introduce the speakers in the sessions. I will still keep time. Um, and so Dean is here as in his role as Vice Provost, but he also runs an active research lab working on cystic fibrosis. Dean, please come and uh, help MC. Thank you, Angie. I, I, I'm going to keep this really short because you're not here to listen to me. Um, but I just wanted to say a huge thank you to April, to Angie, to the whole staff at Irving, to Barbara and Charlotte and many others who have helped to pull this together. It's, it's, I, you know, I was able to participate in most of the morning sessions. It was just really great. And afterwards to see people interacting. So thank you. Um, this afternoon, we're talking about a roadmap to success, and certainly we have some really exciting talks. Um, and the first one is from Mukul Sharma, who is a professor in Earth Sciences, um, doing some really intriguing work that he's going to describe to us. And I will only say this, that Mukul and I both decided to move from Germany to Hanover with one N uh, in about the same time. <laughs> so it was, uh, that was the great migration um, to, to Hanover. So Mukul, please uh, take it away. I guess I'd say to all the speakers, you know, the morning uh, speakers only had three minutes and they kept on time. So please also um, try to keep, keep it moving. Um, this is what no. Take it away. Well, thank you so much for your kind introduction, Dean. Um, and uh, thank you, An Angie and April, I, I, for inviting me. April, I guess, is away. Um, uh, so what I'm going to talk about today is uh, my passion, or has become my passion, uh, which has to do with removing atmospheric CO2. Now, uh, by trade, I'm an isotope geochemist which means that I get to do work on most everything under the sun and also the sun. Uh, I, have, I have a project about solar wind, uh, and I have a project about volcanoes, fracking, ocean chemistry, you name it. But the most important one, which I feel is the one that I will spend a lot of my time now for the next 10 years, has to do with atmospheric CO2 removal, and you all know why that is the case. Okay. Uh, the solution that we need to search for are those that can be rapidly deployed because the, the ship has sailed and they have to be on a large scale. So, but before that, as uh, those who are, who are in medical profession here, they would know, know, first do no harm. Okay, so we, whatever we need to do, we don't need to foul it up further than what we have. Okay, uh, so here is here is a sobering slide, right? In 1973, pointer, okay, here. In 1973, 87% of the energy was being generated by fossil fuels, okay? In 2013, it became 81%, right? And in 2019, it is still 18, 18. So, you know, nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. Right? The population size has increased, and of course, the amount of uh, uh, amount of energy that we are utilizing is somewhat more than what we used to in 1973 per year per capita. Right? So, <clears throat> the carbon emissions that you see from fossil fuels, and this is slide uh, uh, one of the speakers showed in this morning, uh, comes from uh, from BP. Uh, I think this it works this way versus that way. I can't tell you. Um, I, 
the, all this morning, I tried to figure this out by watching this. It seems like it, it doesn't work either ways. Okay. Okay. Uh, so in any case, so you have, this is from 2000 to you know, 2050, this is uh, carbon emissions up to 2020 or so. Uh, uh, and you see that we reach a, we have this peak, about 40 or so thousand gigatons, GD is billions of tons of carbon dioxide, uh, about 40,000 40, or so, right? And then uh, here on the, these curves show uh, some net zero that you have all heard about, the sort of buzz word or buzz phrase, a net zero, how you were gonna drive the CO2 emissions down by reducing carbon, C, carbon dioxide emissions to nearly zero by 2020, which is roughly similar to what uh, should be done to keep the uh, IPCC guideline of 1.5 degrees, right? If you need to, you need to reach there, you need to drive it down to net, close to net zero. Now, if you, if you exceed that, you, well, uh, you have 2%, uh, sorry, two degree uh, Celsius increase uh, that can take place if you have some accelerated uh, sort of decline in, in CO2 reduction, okay? Instead of the net zero, but accelerated by changing, you know, government policies and so forth. Uh, okay, now that is, uh, but now here's the thing. This is what BP calls the new momentum, okay? Which is euphemistic that we simply cannot reduce CO2 emissions, okay? Transition to a low carbon economy is super hard to do, okay? Some sectors are harder to do than the others, okay? So what that says is that the net zero or accelerated CO2 reduction will not be realized. So we are gonna be in some other territory. I mean, this, this morning, Eric Osterberg talked about some other scenarios which go up, far up, Okay, sorry, this screen sort of fly, flying around. Uh, but this is, this is more realistic from BP's perspective. And these guys should know they, they sell oil, okay? Uh, uh, versus other, other people, right? No, so, uh, so what do we need to do? Okay, it has stopped moving. Well, we need to directly remove additional CO2. Okay, and uh, from the atmosphere, and the 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 uh, uh, something that you may have heard, something called CDR, which is carbon dioxide removal. So, for example, to keep warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, uh, one needs to remove about three billion tons of uh, carbon per year, starting 2030. Okay, and that number should continue to rise up to about seven billion tons of carbon in 2050. So that is the gap that is there in the projected uh, curve from BP to where we will be in terms of not being able to reduce emissions to, uh, to where uh, net zero should be, All right? Now, there are different types of tech ZDR technologies. You know, there are different stages of maturation. Okay, someone would say, well, why don't we just plant trees? Okay. All right. So afforestation or reforestation, that's a technology uh, that is there, uh, here, okay? One can put some carbon in the soil, one can create biochar, we'll talk about it in a minute. Uh, then you have bioenergy, carbon sequestration, direct air capture, et cetera, and enhanced weathering, ocean fertilization. These are different types of technologies which are based either on photosynthesis, that is removal of CO2 from the atmosphere, or by, by, by changing the chemistry of the ocean, or by, by removing uh, carbon dioxide. Okay. So uh, the, the two technologies or strategies that we are developing here at Dartmouth uh, involve uh, first removal in the ocean or removal on land. Okay, these are large scale, potentially large scale technologies by in the removal in the ocean by recruiting uh, the marine biological pump with using clay minerals, right? So I'll talk about what this biological pump is, but on this side is a slide that sort of shows 
what I mean by uh, uh, by uh, removing CO2. So you you take out a lot of CO2 from the atmosphere today, present day, but most of it is actually gets released back into the atmosphere. So what, what you want to do is you take out a lot more than what you can do today, but you also minimize the amount of CO2 that get, can be released back into the atmosphere. Two things. Yeah. Now, so that's one technology. Other is has to do with mixing altered basalt and fortified biochar. Okay. So I had I meant to bring you a prop, but uh, the convener did not apply apply the prop. <laughs> did not no. She did not say that. But I didn't want to bring any prop uh, in deference to. Uh, 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 the, our talks. So, so basalt, basalt is a dark rock, like the rock that erupts on Hawaii, okay, in Hawaiian Islands. Uh, but it's pre present uh, everywhere. So, the, this process involves uh, removing CO2 via a process of chemical weathering of basalt. Okay, but we combine it with uh, biochar, which has been fortified, and we'll talk about what that is briefly. Right? So now first, uh, the, for, for the first strategy, the background is very simple. Marine biological pump removes atmos atmospheric CO2. Right? Now how much gets removed? 25 billion tons of carbon. Billion tons of carbon. So it is carbon, if you want to convert that into CO2, you need to multiply it by 3.664. So about 75 billion tons of CO2. It removes uh, in the form of dissolved organic carbon ma matter, right? And about between five and twelve billion tons of carbon as particulate organic matter. Dissolved or organic matter is neutrally buoyant, gets readily chewed up by bacteria. Some of the particulate matter gets also chewed up by bacteria. Actually, how much? Ninety percent of it gets chewed up by bacteria. A small amount makes it down to great depths greater than. Uh, a thousand or so meter. So what is happening is this microbial loop is releasing the CO2 that the phytoplankton work very hard to pick up and they release it right back into the atmosphere every year. So every year uh, 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 the biological pump is on the order of uh, is uh, taking out about 50 or so billion tons of carbon and every year that carbon goes right back up. Right? So to enhance atmospheric CO2 removal and to sequester carbon, one can do the following. One can increase the phyto phytoplankton production by increasing the productivity. Uh, one would take out more CO2, convert that dis dissolved organic matter, which is neutrally buoyant, to particulate matter, which can sink to greater depth, and then, to incre and then increase the depth where the sinking particulate organic matter is respired back to CO2 by bacteria. In, by combining all of this, one can win this, and one can uh, take out maybe billions of tons of carbon uh, when this process is implemented. So concoctions of clay minerals can accomplish these tasks, and I'll show you in a, in a sort of a uh, sketchy way here how it is done. So here is uh, a, here's a model of a clay. So particles of clay are over here, they're, they're charged on the surface. So when they are suspended, they're, they're put in water, they're charged. And then as they are, as they, because they are charged, they start to coalesce together, aggregate together, and they, they become larger and larger. And you can, from, from individual flakes, you have a house of cards at the bottom, right? Now, on the right-hand side are the dissolved organic matter in the form of polymers. These are dissolved material which then has been uh, observed in the, in, uh, in the ocean to turn into gels, which are micron-sized gels. Okay. Again, it is charged. Together, they can combine and make flocks or aggregates that can sink very deep. We have seen that happen in the laboratory. We have seen that happen in, in, the, in the ocean. OK, so that's one thing that clays will do. The other thing that, which is really cool that clays can do or do is this following. This, so you have dissolved organic matter down here. And because it is being picked up 
it is, uh, the, it is being picked up by clays, clays can sh simply shuttle that organic matter into, uh, into the metazoas or protozoas. But what that means is they are basically bypassing heterotrophic bacteria, which are um, metabolizing organic matter, right? So therefore, no CO2 comes out. So that's, that's, that's like shunting. Okay? Third is because clays are denser than seawater, they can take stuff down very rapidly. All right? So that is shown here. This is uh, basically what the process is called ballasting. It's been observed. And uh, if, you, if you have the relative density increase uh, of a particle, sinking velocity increases. If, the, if you have a large aggregate, its velocity also, sinking velocity increases, has been observed in, uh, in the North Atlantic, uh, which receives dust from the Sahara, all right? Now, Sahara is a big dust bowl that supplies a lot of dust to, uh, to North Atlantic. 80% of the dust or more is made up of clay minerals, except that this North Atlantic is not the right place where Sahara should be, dust should be falling. Okay, if it was, it will, if it was going to remove all the CO2, then we would not be talking about climate change. Okay, so there has to be right oceanographic setting, then you can get that done. So, uh, but nonetheless, in the, in the Sahara, it's been observed, for example, blasting of Saharan dust, uh, which can change the carbon export, etc. And this is a particle of a Saharan dust uh, glued together uh, in this, uh, what is called marine snow, literally looks like snow in, uh, in submersible lights. It has a sinking velocity of 500 meters a day. So what that means in two days, this particle is down to a depth of 1,000 meters. That carbon that is associated with this is no longer coming back out. Not for 100 years, more, more, maybe 1,000 years. It depends on the oceanographic setting. OK, so how do you do all of this? Well. Uh, well, you, if you took a concoction of clay minerals sprinkled into large swaths of ocean in the right place, okay, in, I'm thinking Southern Ocean, for example, ocean that circulates around Antarctica, okay, uh, then you can sequester large quantities, billions of tons of carb, uh, you know, carbon can be sequestered. To get there, a lot of work needs to be done. Uh, I showed this picture. Because uh, has, does anyone know anyone Hitchcock fan? Yes. <laughs> so yeah. So the, you know this guy is being chased by this crop duster. Okay. The crop duster wants to bury this guy, which is Mr. Stewart, under manure. <laughs> All right. Uh, so the idea here is the same. You can you, you can haul up large like tens, ten million tons of clay to the right place. Either use a technology to dump that clay from the back of the tanker in the form of slurry, or you can take, you can make uh, right uh, 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 drones, crop dusters, that can do this job for you. So I'm thinking about Benoit's uh, helicopters, birds, and I'm thinking about, uh, okay, I see that I'm running out of time. So I'm thinking about the tankers running on biodiesels that are created by uh, the uh, by uh, Leland's group, right? So, um, okay, I have another minute. So I just want to quickly say something about the sorry uh, altered basalt biochar. This is a second process. Now, this is a process in which uh, we we are, we are creating we are altering basalt, which can be done rapidly in in laboratory at this time and combining it with uh, bi refractory uh, biochar and fortifying the biochar, right? Now, that process, I would don't want to uh, talk more about at this time. Oops. I'm going in there. OK. <laughs> well, I cannot talk about this man. <laughs> All right. No, there should be more of this after this. Volunteer. Hmm. Anyway, so that well, that, 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 that <laughs> settles the issue. Okay, so this this process is basically you can bury carbon on land, and you can car bury carbon on, in the ocean by converting uh, uh, 
by, by doing the chemical weathering, which naturally you take out about, about half a uh, billion tons of carbon naturally today, but by altering the salt, you can take out upwards of a billion tons of carbon, okay? And uh, again, but, but the beautiful pro thing about this process is that in fact, because it's, it's, there are no ships involved, okay? Um, th this can be, once it is perfected, uh, one can pass it around to mama papa operations who can then sell the stuff around. So by doing so, I, I can see that it will be a process just like what the 49ers did, they, they mined the mountains away for gold, okay? The same thing can be done when humans are involved and that carbon can be removed in that fashion. Okay, I'll, I'll stop here. Uh, thank you so much. Yes. Meteorological composition matters of that clay. So what, what type of clay for the ocean are you proposing? I'll have to shoot you for that. <laughs> after that. So yeah, so I we have we figured that we have figured that out. Okay, we'll figure that out. We can talk about but we can we, we figured out what clay we need to use and how much energy will be needed to actually you take that clay, uh, you know, how much energy would be needed to haul it around to say from from uh, from the US down to Southern Ocean, that kind of stuff, we rough calculations we have done. But of course, first thing is to secure it, uh, the science in using mesocosm experiments just near the ocean in the, you know, in the Vineyard Sound, for example. Um, and then we'll go do the, some of the deeper experiments. But at, at every stage, so it is like, you know, this type of process is like going to the moon. You see, it's like a lunar lunar project, or it's like an atomic bomb. Uh, that's Manhattan Project, yeah. So the process is that you want it to be efficacious, and you don't want to foul it up when you're out there. So you have to always be doing it iteratively to make sure. So we'll again tuning it over and over again to ensure uh, that the concoction of clay that we have can be used at, the, at one specific oceanographic setting. It may be different in different setting. Depends on the biology. Yes, sir. Yeah, could you be afraid of uh, indirect effects and think that uh, when you move the carbon from dissolved to particulate matter and things and about you impoverish uh, the amount of carbon in the upper ocean, so you probably handicap your phytoplankton population. Not phytoplankton. It's only those little bacteria that we don't care about. Little bacteria, right. Um, so, in other words, put it a different way. And you're afraid they are going to be killing the goose that makes the, the golden eggs here by, by removing the carbon, and so, then will kill those uh, that step in ecology? So, so what we are, yeah, uh, it's only the bacteria that will be impacted in terms of that they will not be able to take out so much carbon as otherwise is available to them in the dissolved form. Okay. okay? Otherwise, and but what we have done, so we have done lab experiments to see that bacteria are not, you know, they multiply much faster. They, yeah, they, 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 don't, they don't seem to get impacted by this. Now, when we do it a larger system, what happens there, we don't know it yet. But we, uh, uh, our assessment is that we can take out some, not all of that carbon, and be okay. So remember, this is 50 billion tons of carbon that is being removed every day, every year. And then on a small fraction is all that we want to take out. And, and the way to do it is by, by increasing the productivity, which will produce more waste. <laughs> And which will be fine for bacteria. She says, you know, it's a, it's a positive feedback in the near the surface. Right. That leads to my other question about the numbers. When you remove one gigaton of carbon from the upper ocean and bury it at the bottom, uh, how much 
you actually win <coughs> from the atmosphere? Um, that's a good question. A billion tons of carbon that we are removing is uh, a billion ton of carbon from the atmosphere. That's a good question. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's unfortunate. I think we have to, to, to okay. move on given the time constraints. Okay. But there will be a break, everybody, at, yes. at, in about 40 minutes. Um, so please join me again in thanking you for your It's hard to shut off conversation when we're trying to also stimulate it. So please do hold your questions and, and follow up. So our next speaker. Um, is Bob McClellan, um, who uh, has until recently been chief of the section of occupational and environmental medicine uh, at Dartmouth Hitchcock. And uh, Bob, please come in and take it away. I won't. I don't want to take any more of your time for this presentation. I think uh, can we queue up the next? Great. Well, hello, everybody, and uh, thank you for this uh, opportunity to talk to you about the passion. Uh, as an occupational environmental medicine physician, my passion throughout my uh, career has been the relationship between the work environment and the ambient environment and people's health, both in the exam room as well as in the community and the public square. So what I'll be talking about then is this relationship between climate and public health and the health ecosystem. I'm going to start out with um, the bad stuff, the actual impact that we're experiencing now is public, uh, on, on public health and what we can predict for the future, and then move on to talking about the health ecosystem as both a part of the problem but also, and now we're going to start the transition to a part of the solution, and then end up with really thinking about how to frame this conversation with our patients, our colleagues, our community citizens, and on the public square to both engage, empower, and activate. So um, as my colleague Sarah Crockett said earlier today, the WHO has said that climate change is the single biggest health threat facing humanity. In this country, our Surgeon General has said that climate change is a serious, immediate, and global threat to human health. And the National Academy of Medicine has said that climate, has said that climate change represents one of the most significant threats to human health in the 21st century. So you've probably seen a lot of these concerns before, but I think it's particularly powerful to put it all on one slide. Because for all uh, intents and purposes, a climate can change can have an impact on essentially every organ system. Temperature increases. Heat waves have been increasing now. We've been counting um, heat strokes, increasing heat exhaustion, um, deaths, and um, and uh, as temperature goes up, both outdoor workers, who are particularly susceptible, but indoor workers without AC are also susceptible, so does productivity go down. Impacts on air quality, talked about a little bit this morning, increase in allergens in the air, increase air pollutants, driving cardiopulmonary disease, uh, driving, um, and in fact, uh, driving um, um, dementia as well. Extreme weather events, uh, flooding we've been very used to in this, um, this past uh, um, hurricane season. Um, when flooding can cause direct injury and drowning, um, but also can leave behind uh, polluted water, um, both with chemical, chemical contaminants as well as infectious diseases. And it not only destroys health directly, but also it destroys infrastructure critical to supporting people's health and well-being and destroys those buildings that people call home. Vector-borne disease is increasing right now. We know we have to deal with uh, black leg ticks whenever we go um, outdoors. And mosquito-borne diseases are coming um, northward um, uh, with uh, climate um, and warming. 
um, so that we have now dengue fever and concern, concerns about dengue fever and uh, various encephalitis uh, diseases, et cetera. And then water-related illnesses are also um, increasing. We heard about cyanotoxins um, related to algal blooms um, this morning, um, but um, other types of uh, water contamination and pollution is also uh, a big concern. In Jackson, uh, Mississippi, after heavy precipitation, the water infrastructure went down, and now there are people, um, thousands of people without access to potable, to potable water. And an impact on nutrition and food safety. We heard um, a couple of talks this morning about impact on the nutritional value of food as, um, as climate changes um, and, and as drought in, impacts um, harvesting. Um, and concerns about food spoilage as well. And then <clears throat> we're very concerned about mental health. Um, some more than 50% of adults um, in the United States have uh, report climate anxiety. This is a huge issue, um, and many younger people in particular are now making choices, sometimes life and death choices, or choices as to whether to have children because they're so worried about uh, what the climate may bring forward. But there's increasing amounts of depression, depression, increasing amounts of anxiety, PTSD associated with weather disasters, um, a huge, huge issue that we do not have the resources to treat on a one-by-one -one basis, but really need uh, much more systemic um, uh, interaction, uh, intervention. And then something else that we don't talk about enough is the uh, millions and millions of people migrating because of climate. We heard about Pakistan this morning, a third of that country um, uh, underwater. In 2020, some 40 million people moved because their land had become uninhabitable. This is likely to increase. And with that climate um, uh, migration will come more competition for resources and conflict, including at just the interpersonal level. So this is a conceptual model for how this all happens. Um, this is put together by the uh, uh, US uh, Program for Global Change Research. And you can see how climate drivers, increased temperatures, precipitation extremes, et cetera, can lead to environmental conditions and environmental hazards that expose human beings um, to hazards. And this can result in some of the health outcomes that I mentioned. But importantly, take a look at these two issues on the side, the environmental and institutional context. Do you live on the coast, for example? Um, what is the condition of your housing? Um, and importantly, those social determinants of health that um, are so important in terms of mediating the impact of these exposures and whether or not someone can tolerate them. And climate is having an impact on health systems. This picture outside of Bellevue Hospital uh, during Hurricane Sandy, because the mechanical systems and electrical systems had failed and they could not take care of people. And so Hurricane Sandy, Hurricane Ian, um, the healthcare infrastructure itself, which is so needed during these emergencies, failing and going down. There is a recent study um, of um, 50 metro areas um, and, um, and hospitals along the coast. And in fact, it's, it's estimated that about 50% of those are flood during even minor hurricanes. So the US healthcare system is not only a victim, but it's also a perpetrator. Um, as we heard this morning, it's somewhere it's in the range of between uh, responsible between eight and 10% of US um, greenhouse gas emissions, which we can divide into three scopes. Those that are the direct emissions as a result of the activities and the combustion that goes on within the building itself, anesthetic gases, we heard about endoscopy, um, et cetera the indirect emissions that are resulted from uh, the purchase of power from the outside. And then scope three refers to all those other emissions uh, uh, that are associated with commuting, commuting to and from the, uh, the facility as well as the supply chain. So first do no harm. Um, thank you for saying that. So the National Academy of Medicine um, has aligned itself with this, this aspect of the 
Hippocratic Oath, and uh, just a year ago stood up the Action Collaborative on decarbonizing the, U the US health sector. And the White House and um, uh, HSS have combined to call on, all, on the health sector to pledge for emission reductions and resilience. At a minimum, to reduce organizational emissions by some 50% by 2030 and achieve net zero by 2050 with annual public uh, accounting. To, to designate an executive level lead for reducing emissions by 2023 and to conduct an inventory of scope three emissions by the end of 2024. Um, uh, several of us in this room are working with DH with great hopes that they will sign this pledge. And then also to build a climate resilience plan for being able to continuously operate during these climate, these weather emergencies that occur by the end of 2023. And we will, by anticipating the needs of those that experience disproportionate risk of climate related harm. So One Health refers to this concept of an inextricable linkage of humans, animals, and their ecosystems. And it's postulated that by integrating the study and the practice of veterinary medicine and human medicine, that these approaches will save human and animal lives and reduce costs when compared to public and animal health sectors working separately. There's great hope that by integrating surveillance data systems that will be able to identify um, identify outbreaks of zoonoses, that is, uh, diseases caused by transmission from animals to human beings much earlier, and therefore be able to uh, better protect um, human health. So uh, Dr. Crockett mentioned the New Hampshire Healthcare Workers Organize and Act within New Hampshire itself. Uh, this stood up about a year ago and has been incredibly productive in terms of uh, bringing in experts um, uh, from around the country uh, to talk to our citizens uh, our, and physicians and other healthcare workers um, about various aspects of climate change and what they can do about it in the exam room as well as on the, in the public square. They've, they've set up a number of different working groups uh, from anything from public advocacy to children's health, behavioral health, climate justice, um, et cetera. So let me turn now in terms of thinking about how we frame the, cl the climate conversation. Uh, I don't know about you, but I have not really been involved in climate per se until I saw this polar bear, whatever that was, 20 years or so ago. And that was the kind of the iconic damage that people thought about in the media when we talked about climate change. Is what is it going to do to the polar bear, to other wildlife, to other species, et cetera. Or we hear about it as an economic issue, how much it's going to cost to do something, how much it's going to cost if we don't do anything. Um, and it, it turns out that um, a study, a communications firm, Besson Communications, did a study of over 600 media, contemporary media articles and only 6% of those had the word health in, in those articles. So I think there's an option to really think carefully about our communications, to really think about engaging, empowering, and activating. The general climatic change is among the first to examine the effects of using the words climate crisis and climate emergency, terms that came out into the public square uh, because of concerns that people were not taking this seriously enough. But a recent study by Feldman et al. showed that these phrases did not have any effect on public engagement. Measures in terms of whether the words had altered their emotions or their support for climate policy or their belief that action could make a difference. Indeed, there's a lot of evidence accumulating that simply doomsaying paralyzes people. They may be informed, but they feel as though there's no hope. I feel hopeless. There's nothing I can do about it. Uh, one woman who's really studied this a lot 
uh, recently by the name of Karen Peho, um, said that what stimulated her to think deeply about how to communicate with people about this was when her elementary school age child came home and he was not interested in doing his homework. And like any good mom said, no, you gotta do this because you know your future, blah, blah, blah. I said, but mom, I don't have any future. I don't have a future. We're not gonna be alive after 2035 or whatever. I mean, even saying that makes me almost wanna cry because so many children in particular, or young uh, uh, college students feel this way about their future. So I think there's a real power in framing the climate conversation as a health issue. Because after all, this is about us. It's not just about the planet, okay? Time went, oh, we're done, 30 seconds. Um, this, is not, this is not about, um, just about polar bears, it's not just about, but ultimately, existentially, it's about us. And it turns out that um, as healthcare workers, we have a particularly high level of trust. We also have a high penetration into the community where we can talk, whether it be in the exam room or in a uh, public, public arena. The other thing that really seems to engage people is when we talk, when we, we say we talk about what's gonna happen, but we also pair that with here are the solutions, many of which we've been hearing today and leaves me feeling uh, more hopeful perhaps than I did in the morning because I didn't know about all that was going on. So the takeaways are climate change affects the social and environmental determinants of health, clean air, safe drinking water, sufficient food, and secure shelter. Between 2030 and 2050, climate change is expected to cause about 250,000 additional deaths worldwide per year. Malnutrition, malaria, diarrhea, health, heat stress, and climate change is going to end up increasing health inequities. Reducing emissions of greenhouse gases can result in improved health, particularly through reduced air pollution. And the U.S. health system currently is contributing to the crisis and must urgently take steps to mitigate emissions and adapt to the changing climate and bring climate-informed care into the exam room. The One Health Initiative aims to restore ecosystem health as the foundation for, hum for human and animal health. And if we frame the conversation correctly, we can, rather than paralyze people with doomsaying, we can engage them, empower, and activate them. And we have heard a smattering of some of the growing activities occurring on not just this campus, but also the health campus on climate and health. CO2 emission, uh, it seems to me that in order to do that, someone had to be looking at the baselines at that time. So how do you do it uh, retrospectively? Excellent question. Um, and I suspect you're right, that probably very few uh, uh, facilities within the health sector have done it. Actually, DH did do, um, uh, looked at their carbon footprint at least a decade ago. It may have been even more than that. Um, and we hope to be able to actually use that as a comparison, but I suspect that that's going to be, um, you know, a real challenge. I, I, I thought that was a terrific talk, so thank you for giving us agree with your comments on the young people and their state of mind. How do you, how do you strike a balance between giving people hope and leading and being positive with also spurring I'm going to leave today and get in my car and drive, and I'm consuming right. you know, food from networks that are using carbon emissions. How do you strike that balance between urgency but also hope? That's an unfair question to ask. No, no, it's question. very fair. It's very fair. And I mean, first of all, we need to um, remember there's both adaptation and mitigation. And so let's start in the exam room. So um, in the exam room, uh, an individual comes in with asthma. And I know that there's a heat wave coming in two weeks. 
So I can prepare my patient medically for better being able to deal with that, both in terms of their behavior as well as their medication. Or someone who I'm treating with a mental health issue, and many of the medications used uh, to treat mental health, mental, mental illness may actually make you less resilient to heat. So in the exam room, I can help my patients who are managing chronic diseases uh, better able to manage those without uh, being aggravated. I can also connect with that patient to, to, uh, on, on their health level, not necessarily even talking about the climate, but talking about solutions, things they can do to, to perhaps decrease their emissions, yes, but we don't have to use those terms per se, depending upon you know the particular audience you're talking to. Great, so I think we have to move on now. And, and again, we'll have more time for conversation. Great, uh, thank you so much for a great talk. Thanks for joining me. are familiar to many of us at, at Dartmouth. Melody Brown Birkins, uh, who is the director of the Arctic Institute here, and Ross Virginian, who's a uh, former director of the Arctic Institute and a professor now in the Environmental Studies Department. Um, both have had a huge impact in developing the, the climate and Arctic uh, infrastructure at Dartmouth, the intellectual communities, and, uh, and also our outreach into the community globally, so both of which are important. So please. Take it away. I don't know how you want to do it with the microphones. Do you, do you want to share a, yeah. Yeah. a carry one? one. That's the second one right here. And you have to keep them fairly I'm close right to, um, for them to work. Secret that scientists always have a lot of that slides. <laughs> yeah. Well, fantastic. Thank you very much. It's great to be here to talk a little bit about the Institute of Arctic Studies. Um, and um, we're going to focus on th this institute. And if you go through the history of Dartmouth and go through uh, the books and begin to look, institutes and centers are actually pretty recent things at Dartmouth College. It's not part of our longstanding tradition to organize ourselves in this way. And the Institute of Arctic Studies is perhaps one of the earliest and longest continuously acting institutes at Dartmouth. So um, maybe we're going to be a little bold here and suggest that there are aspects of the development and the inspiration for Arctic Studies and how it's grown and where it's going. And maybe these, maybe this discussion is helpful to the Irving Institute, which has tremendous potential and actually shares sort of a, a birth story that's somewhat similar. So I'm, I'm past director of Arctic Studies. I'm going to talk about the past, Arctic past. And Melody's going to talk about, because she is the future, of what this amazing institute's going to be doing. So we're going to talk about this in the context of building a community, because really that's what we're doing here today, is building and reinforcing and launching a new community. And I think the success of the Institute of Arctic Studies and, and also the Dickey Center, because they're inseparable, is really about community at different levels, uh, students, faculty, alumni, and then the whole fields of practitioners and leaders that have been connected through time to the work that we do. So if you want to go back, um, I think that influential leaders and important people that have an association with Dartmouth really kind of make things happen here. And Arctic roots at Dartmouth, I could trace it back to Ledger, but I don't have enough time to do that, but that's where they actually begin. Um, John Sloan Dickey, the director of the Dickey Center, but president of Dartmouth. What Dickey did was made Dartmouth an international institution. He pulled us out of being a New England regional college at that time to become a, a player at the international level, and we've moved forward ever since then. 
One of the things that he did was he attracted Wilhelm Stephenson to the college during his time. Stephenson was uh, uh, the last of the heroic age Arctic explorers, anthropologist, but he was the person that established the Arctic as an important place for the US policy world, but also recognizing that the indigenous cultures of the Arctic had much to teach us. And he was one of the first people to kind of put that forward. And these ultimately are the roots of the Institute of, of Arctic Studies. So the combination of international and then Willemer Stephenson showing that the Arctic was important to the US and that the Arctic was international space. So through that, um, something called the Northern Studies Program emerged. And at its time, this is in the 60s, uh, late 50s, 60s, it was the third most popular program at Dartmouth, among the men of Dartmouth, okay? So that Dartmouth was actually very Arctic in that era. Um, and uh, in, in that process, um, they developed an approach which um, was picked up by, uh, subsequently by the Dickey Center and the legacy of their leadership. And the first is that they had this vision of the Arctic as being important well into the future at a time when others weren't thinking about it that way. Um, Dickey was all about the great issues. The great issue scholars here at Dartmouth are based on that. So both Dickey and Stevenson understood what the great issues were for the Arctic, but what they were gonna become. So they were both addressing the, the present, but thinking towards the future. And I think that's building community is really about bridging those two aspects of time. They both uh, fostered uh, internationalism, but also interdisciplinary. Um, Stevenson was a very interdisciplinary person. Dickey was an expert on Canada and always looked to the north. And uh, they, they sort of launched Dartmouth in this direction. The outcome of that is that Arctic began to infuse the college, both in education, the Northern Studies Program, research. Um, uh, Stephenson published many, many books, hundreds of papers, set a core of research and scholarship as embedded in all of this that was going on, and then public outreach. And I think that we've already been seeing how important that is in communication. And finally, um, uh, uh, Stevenson was very engaged in Arctic policy, particularly during World War II and into the Cold War. And um, this is something the Dickey Center has taken on, really, is to be a convener and amplifier of the interface between science and policy and diplomacy uh, to the betterment of society, wherever, they may, wherever that may be. So the, the core, when thinking about how this has all evolved, you know, we're an academic institution, and the core of this really is still based in research. And it's based in scholarship uh, by faculty, by engagement with students, and with colleagues around the world. Um, this is an example of a paper recently published by a graduate student here in the S program, focused on uh, dry and tundra lakes and their impacts on permafrost. Um, and it's an ecology paper. But this student went through training through our IGERT NSF program to understand how to connect that research to the relevance of the lives of people in the North and to be able to communicate that relevance. And that's the new way of doing science. And that's, I think Melody is gonna talk a lot about this new, this new model. So at the crux of this, through time, the community is built through some of these things. It's built through teaching where we share ideas. It's built through outreach where we go out beyond the walls of the institution. And it's around communication. Um, we've become more interested in communication. We know that it's essential. It's not just about doing our science anymore and publishing papers in those great journals. That's essential, we need that new knowledge. But we need to find a way to move it about and inspire people and build community around that knowledge. Um, one way of doing this is to take people into these environments. This is a Dartmouth alumni trip um, to Baffin Island in Greenland. Um, about the middle of that picture on the right with the whale in front is uh, Bill Hanlon and Gail in a kayak. Um, I was uh, in a, a slightly larger boat, but they seemed very excited at that moment. Um, they'll forever be thinking about the Arctic and caring about the Arctic and speaking for the Arctic. So um, community is also built by sharing experiences in these places and moving people about. 
I think the last thing here I want to mention is that um, community has been built through time. This is not simple. Um, it takes time and effort and sustained effort to build trusted partnerships for engagement around any great issue. Right? And the Institute of Art Studies has had the, the support of Dartmouth and the Dickey Center to do things that, that allow that continuity. That, that can't ever be accomplished in the, a three-year NSF grant with a gap in funding. So that's an opportunity for us to build community because we're in a special place where community matters to us. Here, here are some leaders and some amazing people that have graduated from Dartmouth and have gone on to be leaders and are leaders in the Arctic. We have Ambassador Brzezinski. Um, Vivian's a, a native Alaskan who's uh, head of all the mayors in Alaska. Um, Nicole Kanyarak is a 2013 graduate, a uh, Fulbright Arctic Scholar, and is now Vice President of the Inuit Circumpolar Council of Alaska, and is a, a, a biologist on the North Slope of Alaska. Um, Angus King, Senator King, Dartmouth alum, is uh, co-chairs the Senate the, uh, Legislative Caucus on the Arctic. Um, and on and on and on. This is just an example that building community comes from relationships and people at different stages in their career, and each of these people brings a network that was begun early and can be traced all the way back to the early leadership of, of Stephenson, of Dickey, and now into the future, the new leadership of Arctic Studies, and I would dare say that Melody Perkins is launching that next step, so I'm going to turn it over to her. Thank you, Ross. Thank you, Ross. Oh, I need the, everybody heard it. Formal handover. <laughs> um, so I'll try to hold this closer, as you mentioned to do. Uh, so I'm going to talk about. Uh, thank you, Ross built Ross and previous directors and Dartmouth built this incredible institute that you have seen. Um, it is such an honor and responsibility to take it forward. So I'm going to go a little bit on the present and the future of this building community that we're on that that we want all of you to be part of. Um, the Institute of Arctic Studies and the John Sloan Dickey Center. We're really looking at now, as we look towards climate issues, how do we bring science policy and solutions that are informed by Arctic knowledge? This goes back to Wilhelm Stephenson, working with indigenous communities, working with Arctic communities. How does that knowledge actually, not just us taking our knowledge to those communities, how does that knowledge inform our solutions? How do we co-create those questions with our researchers and our policy folks together with the communities who are at the front lines of climate change where it's happening four times the rate of the rest of the world. I will tell you just a quick personal note is that I actually am from Alaska, so why the US is an Arctic nation is that we have Alaska in our midst and is one of the eight Arctic nations and it also hosts about four of the indigenous Arctic indigenous peoples who are part of governance of the Arctic. Um, so my home and my heart is in the Arctic, and again, it's such an honor to be here at Dartmouth, where I also got my PhD degree and my master's degree, and to be here leading the Institute of Arctic Studies. I'm going to show you, this is from Alaska, all of the beginning of September, the end of a typhoon. When we're talking climate change, we're talking about things that are happening today, now. Vivian Cortus, who we heard was an indigenous leader of the mayors, immediately after this, she wrote a very powerful letter saying, you have ignored us long enough. We need the money, we need the support, we need the time, for, we need the infrastructure for our communities. We are being hit by climate change actively. And do, you know, listen to us, stop ignoring what we need. And this is part of the future of Arctic science and policy, is People have to hear this and understand what is actually going on in the Arctic and how do we bring our knowledge to be part of the climate solutions. This is a picture uh, from Rick Toen, the climate specialist at the UAF, I actually grew up in Fairbanks, um, saying there hasn't been a September storm this strong in the northern Bering Sea region in past 70 years. So these are big impacts on our Arctic communities and our Arctic lands and oceans. So in the climate, uh, I'm very honored also in the climate world to be one of the faculty in this great institution that gets asked about things like IPCC reports, and this last one was a doozy. And 
uh, we saw from that, I was asked to comment. But I wanted to comment on it both as a Dartmouth folk person and Institute of Arctic Studies. And the report said there's only a brief window of time to respond. We've heard about the communication on this and keeping hope and agency alive. And I absolutely agree with it, but I do love also pushing on the urgency. We've known about this for far too many decades not to be acting immediately. When I said I had reaction to the report, these are kind of the pivotal ideas of taking uh, the Institute of Arctic Studies now and into the future, is first and foremost, as I mentioned, we need to listen and learn from Arctic knowledge. Let's not forget that. It's a different way of doing research and scholarship and policy. How do we really listen and think of how uh, those questions inform our ideas, our research, our policy, our education, and our, pol our solutions? How do we build upon this Dartmouth history and leadership? We are a very privileged institution. I've heard from the State Department, presence is policy. We have been able to be in the Arctic, engage with these communities, build trust over decades. Let's not lose that. We have to be there. We have to be there humbly and thoughtfully and informed and learn from them. But we have, you'll see, I'll have a little slide, we have incredible leaders who are known throughout the world. And the Institute of Arctic Studies wants to connect this knowledge here on campus from all disciplines with those decision makers around the world. And let's not be shy. It's time to speak out for more informed and inclusive scholarship and decision making. And Dartmouth can be at the center of this. It fits with our history. It fits with where we're going. It puts us at a leadership role in the future of scholarship and policy. And the Arctic needs it. So I, I'm going through those three, first and foremost, I said to include and, and center on Arctic knowledge. Dr. Daly Sambodor of the University of Alaska Anchorage was just here about a few, three or four weeks ago. We were just working with her uh, with a small delegation in Iceland as well. We're looking at the future of climate research with indigenous leadership and engagement. And she is willing to work with us. We're so honored for that. Ross had brought her here many times, developed lots of uh, developed that trust. Um, uh, one of, you'll hear from Barbara Porquino Williams, an indigenous scholar here at Dartmouth who has also worked with her. This is what she said. Inuit are facing an existential threat and are experiencing violation of our fundamental human right to safe and healthy environments. She was the, and, and that is a core piece of the indigenous perspective on the future of climate change and research is let's center it on human rights and self-determination and let's get to those issues of food security and land security and uh, that come with the changing climate. She, again, she was the head of the International uh, Circumpolar Council. Sorry, I'll go a little bit over. Um, 180,000 Inuit of the Arctic. So we work with her. Thank you. National strategy for Arctic. If you get to the military and the security side of things, there is an understanding that we should co-produce knowledge and indige indigenous knowledge into our federal processes. This includes the research infrastructure. They're saying that this is a White House document that just came out about two weeks ago. Again, we have this at Dartmouth. I'm just showing three here. This is in Nature. This is on you know, NPR, CNN. These are folks uh, I'm highlighting here. Don Perovich, Eric Osterberg. Um, Mathieu Morligam is uh, in here. We also have Meredith Kelly. We have Caitlin Hicks-Priest. We have Lauren Culler here in the audience. Um, we have so many of you. Uh, Colin Meyer. We have folks here who do incredible work. How do we make sure that they are part of this conversation we're having at the Institute of Arctic Studies with our global Arctic partners? And last, I'm going to say speaking out. This is Angus King, uh, Senator King. I'm on this panel. We're talking about the future of the Arctic and how we should think about research and policy. There are indigenous leaders at this table. There are Greenlandic folks. There are folks from the shipping industry. There's the US State Department. There's Canada ministers. And here's what we were just in Iceland. These are my colleagues. You'll hear from Barbara, Lauren Culler, just spoke earlier this morning. Barbara speaking on COVID-19 and indigenous communities to packed rooms in Iceland. And Lauren Culler is talking about the future of ethical research between US and Greenland. We have, we're at the center of thinking about the future of the decadal Arctic research plan by the United States and others. We're on the steering committee. Uh, we had a, this 10-year global plan. We're thinking about how we bring more indigenous leadership into Arctic research. Dartmouth should be part of that. We're talking with Native American Indigenous Studies about this. Thank you. I can start off with one. Um, I'm just, you know, I, I, I think this is such a such a great uh, 
trajectory, you know, Ross, you opened with this idea that there may be ways for other centers to learn from the experience of the Arctic Studies Institute. And I think someone earlier today made a comment about how there seems to be a new interest in center and, and institute building at Dartmouth. I think we're seeing that in, in many dimensions. So I guess maybe, could I ask you to be explicit about that? What were the, what do you, are there two or three take, you know, sort of most important points that you would want to tell to a group that's building an institute or a center at Dartmouth? Right. And, 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 you know, sort of from the thinking both past and present, yeah, and future. Um, well, I'm really excited about the fact that institutes and centers are hubs. They get to think across all disciplines. They get to think across all communication strategies. They get to use the excellence from uh, across our, not only our current Dartmouth faculty and the, the scholarship, but also our students and also our, uh, all those alumni. We have that ability, that's how we build our infrastructure is to support those kinds of things, those workshops, global workshops, local workshops. And we think about maybe other people who should be at the table in, in addition to the scholars. That's what I see Irving doing today. Um, different kinds of conversations, different kinds of pairings, and we do it to push the knowledge forward, bring in diverse knowledge systems, because I always say the, these global challenges, if we want inclusive, equitable, and sustainable solutions, we need more inclusive, equitable, and sustainable knowledge systems informing them, and we have that across Dartmouth, and these centers and institutes can think differently than a department might, and we can bring in those resources and support all of you and, great, and create even more impactful communities for the future. Yes. Um, <laughs> in addition to that, I think one of the things is the power to convene. Um, Dartmouth, based on this history and the community, we can bring the right people and the best people and we can identify opportunities to bring, as, as Melody is saying, new people to here, to other places, to work with us, to um, uh, understand what the questions are how they should be framed in a new way to, to benefit of society at large. Irving, energy and society, Arctic studies, is our society, our indigenous communities mainly, uh, but also the policy community. So I, I think we really should recognize that, that that's something we can do better at, more of, um, and um, it brings us into the international community, into the policy community. But it's one way for us to engage more directly back and forth in a sustained way with the Arctic. So the power of, to convene is a huge asset that we have, that institutes and centers have unique resources to support. Yeah. Oh, there's a question. Yeah, it, it's, it's a very central piece. Um, Dartmouth is co-leading with uh, the Inuit Circuit Board Council, the Lancet Commission on Accelerating Arctic Indigenous Health and Well-Being. And you saw the picture of Daly uh, Sample Doro. She's co-leading that effort with Lisa Adams of Dartmouth and DHMC. We have 30 com Lancet commissioners working on a major report, um, an agenda-setting report. More than half of the commissioners are indigenous. And much of what we did in that process was figuring out how do we produce a Lancet style report from the vision of indigenous leaders who are thinking about wellness and well being from their perspective and not just the, what's the latest disease that we need to cure. So, yeah, th this is a great area of dialogue. It's interdisciplinary, it's important, it's indigenous, um, and it's exactly what Dartmouth can do better than just about any other place. All right, I think we should probably break now and hope that the conversations will continue over coffee. Uh, so our, our, our final panel actually includes four speakers. We have um, Josh Compton, who's a professor of speech. Josh, come on down. Um, we also have Brooke Harrington, who's a professor of sociology. We have um, Barbara Williams and also Pavel Sodian, DJ who are all, um, who actually have, uh, there was some, a, a little travel excitement. 
uh, getting getting here, but it, it all worked out. Um, and you know, I guess maybe we can ask you to share time among you. We have the same 20 minutes, so maybe three or four minutes a piece as a starting uh, starting thing. So we have some time for questions at the end. I don't who does some who wants to start. Everybody wants us to start. Uh, do you want to go? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, So I'm Josh Compton, professor of speech, and I study inoculation theory, which is a classic theory of resistance to influence that basically says that we can be inoculated against misinformation in much the same ways that we can be inoculated against viruses, and that's through inoculation, through pre-exposure to weakened forms of an impending threat. So in other words, instead of just ignoring misinformation, we can actually harness it and then wield it against itself. For example, if we considered the myth that there is a lack of a scientific consensus about human contribution to climate change, one option would, would be not to talk about it and hope that other people don't hear it. Another way would be to inoculate. So we would actually preemptively bring that myth up, preemptively refute it, and that would then motivate resistance to future exposures to that counter argument and importantly, additional counter arguments like that one. So inoculation based messages actually spread an umbrella of, of protection against theoretically any attack on an existing issue. So communication scientists have applied this theory to contexts like politics, uh, health, marketing, public relations against a wide range of issues and when it comes to science communication, if you uh, are interested in taking a look as to what we've done with inoculation theory in science communication in general and inoculation theory in particular, you can take a look at this review of the literature that is in uh, Social and Personality Psychology Compass, published just last year, or by following that QR code. So thanks for giving me a couple of minutes to share with you some of the potential of inoculation theory. sociologists doing talking to you folks at the Irving Institute. I, I don't study climate, I don't study energy, I study offshore finance, which has, well, it's tangentially related to the interests of the Irving Institute because a lot of offshore finance is used to evade environmental laws, as we saw with the recent impeachment of the president of Chile for trying to circumvent his own country's laws about mining operations, which are very profitable but very bad for the environment. So my real reason for being here is that before I went to grad school in sociology, I was a journalist. So I worked for Associated Press and Newsweek, and I've used that background ever since to inform my own dissemination of my research, both to figure out how to make it intelligible to non-specialists and to figure out how to identify outlets and editors who would be receptive to the message I wanted to put out there. So that's what I hope to share with you today. Um, back in the day, I covered the World Series and the Miss World competition. I met Desmond Tutu and Magic Johnson. It was a wonderful career. Um, hard way to make a living, though. I much prefer academia. <laughs> so what I want to talk about very quickly is how to make complex ideas intelligible and show how they relate to people's everyday lives so that you can engage them. So I, I got to do this recently, very frequently, um, with the recent spate of sanctions on Russian oligarchs, because that involves the use of offshore finance. All these oligarchs who are Putin's henchmen are uh, rich because they use offshore. So I ended up, uh, in, I think in March or April, being on CNN once a week. Live television is really hard. I'm happy to share what I learned about that. 
Um, but mostly what I do is I write op-ed pieces, not just about Russian oligarchs, but when the Pandora Papers broke a year ago, I wrote a piece for the Washington Post and another for the New York Times I'll tell you about in a second. Um, but also, I publish stuff that is about other parts of my research. This is part of the stuff that most people would consider the most boring part of what I do, which is sociology of the professions. You know, what are you on? But it actually turns out to be highly relevant to what happens in the world of uh, environmental expertise and medicine and law and even academia. So that was one of, I think, a dozen pieces I published in the Atlantic now. There's some key skills I think anyone can learn in making their research intelligible and compelling for ordinary people, non-specialists. Um, one that I would particularly recommend is the careful use of analogies. These are really crucial in making complex ideas um, or specialist terminology easier to grasp with as little sacrifice and accuracy as possible. And that's always the difficulty when you're trying to communicate with non-specialist audiences, right? You have to sacrifice some precision and accuracy. But to do it with, I think, as little loss as possible, selection of good analogies is one way to go. In this piece, um, two years ago, you may remember that a big news story was that former President Trump had paid only $750 in income tax for a year despite his claims to being a billionaire. So I actually wrote an article about my research pegged to that news hook using an analogy of Dine and Dash. Does everyone know what Dine and Dash is? You know, where you go out to say a group meal or maybe it's an individual meal and you sneak out the door before the bill comes due? Well, that's a fairly accurate description of what tax evaders do. They stick the rest of us with the bill for the, the great meal that is civilized society. Um, the other thing I would suggest is, as to the extent possible, trying to make the impacts of your research as concrete as possible so people can understand. One of the things I tell people, and I think I mentioned in this article, is that when the ultra-wealthy of society don't pay their fair share of taxes, somebody has to keep the lights on in government. It may not work very well, but at least the lights stay on. And guess who foots that bill? The former commission of the, commissioner of the IRS, Charles Rosati, said 20 years ago that he estimated that the average non-wealthy American paid a 15% surcharge on their income taxes in order to make up the shortfall caused by elite tax evasion. That number must be greatly increased by now, simply because the amount of tax evasion by elites has increased. That's pretty relatable. You pay 15% extra on your income taxes. So maybe let's not cheerlead for the wealth creators who are dining and dashing on the rest of us. My grandma could understand that. So to the extent that you can relate your research to everyday issues or to issues of major concern, like in the UK, you may know people are having trouble heating their homes and it's going to get worse as the weather gets colder. Tie it into that. Look for things that could plausibly be related to your research. Um, one of the things I want to point out is you have to do those two things. Come up with some good analogies and come up with ways in which your work relates to the everyday life of non-specialists because you first have to pitch it to editors in order to get it out there in the world. Um, they're your first non-specialist audience. Secondly, you can be creative about how you decide to, to pitch out rights of editors. There doesn't necessarily have to be a new discovery on your part in order to pen an article or go on television. I mean, there could be. That's a perfectly good reason. But oftentimes, all you need to do is just like be an informed newsreader and say, oh, this new story actually does relate to what I do. Let me pitch an editor on it. And so you you sort of, um, you become the, you put the spoonful of sugar around the medicine of your complex research. In, in the reporting business, that's called the news hook. Um, so when the Pandora Papers came out a year ago, I pitched the New York Times and said, you know, I do some research that's really relevant to this. I can shed light on why the Pandora Papers are important and make it make sense to people who haven't been following this. And they said, okay, 
And there it, it ended up not only online, but in a print edition. So here's another thing that I, I want to just mention briefly. A lot of my work trying to publicize research on offshore finance started with this piece in the Atlantic um, almost exactly seven years ago. Um, and it was, it was just a story about how I did the research on offshore finance, because it's a very secretive world, and they don't take calls or emails from nosy sociologists or journalists. So how did I actually do the research? The story of how you did your research might also be interesting to the right audiences, if you can frame it in the right way. The story of how you gather your data, or some new methodology that you've innovated. Believe it or not, framed in the right way, those can be very compelling stories. And I would encourage you to think about how to tell them to a non-specialist audience. So I will just conclude by saying, here's how I think I might be able to be helpful if anyone wants some follow-up from me. Identifying media outlets and editors that might be receptive to your work. Finding the news hooks for your work so that you don't just have to pop up into the news when you make a new discovery, because I understand those are fairly rare events. Um, how to craft analogies that will tie into people's everyday experience or topics of popular interest. Strategizing how to use all of the above to approach editors and outlets. So you can reach me at brookharrington at dartmouth.edu and I look forward to your comments. I don't know, should we keep this picture? <laughs> because we are going to, uh, to uh, um, speakers uh, from Russia. Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, yeah. Um, uh, my name is uh, uh, Varvara. Oh. Oh, maybe this is the uh, Okay, let, let me start uh, uh, first because uh, yeah, I think that uh, this is uh, important. Uh, my name is Varvara. My uh, indigenous um, uh, native, um, indigenous uh, uh, name is Barbak. Um, I'm a Kumandin scholar from Siberia. And thank you so much for inviting me here. And uh, I'm honored to be on uh, uh, traditional and uh, unceded uh, lands of the Meki people. Uh, and uh, I was asked to share uh, indigenous perspective on climate change. And um, I don't know, could we vote? What do we like to say, Western knowledge or uh, science is science? So <laughs> what is less offensive? Um, uh, anyway, uh, we have a different, uh, of course, uh, uh, view on uh, climate change because for indigenous peoples, climate change is, of course, Western concept because for indigenous peoples, climate change is a way what uh, I think town business school people know, right? That if you take too much, you are in debt and you have to pay back. This is what go what's going on uh, for, for indigenous peoples because, uh, for example, Nenets, uh, uh, Nenets uh, people are um, uh, reindeer uh, herders in uh, Tundra. So, uh, and they, uh, they are there for time immemorial and they know how to live in tundra and keep it in the same way when they came. And this is our wisdom, to live without any trace you have been here. Take everything with you. And that is how indigenous peoples managed to be sustainable, <laughs> you know, to be, um, uh, to save ourselves and our uh, uh, home. And another um, way you cannot take more than you need, because when you take more, Mother Earth, uh, rivers, uh, salmon, they would not, you can take now, but you won't have it next day. Uh, you won't have a harvest in 10 years, in 50 years. And this is how we manage, again, uh, to be uh, again, to be sustainable, right? Um, and uh, another thing that Melody already talked about, uh, Arctic, uh, indigenizing Arctic, I wanted to say that we are all connected. Now, neither business who does um, mining in Arctic or this is a scientist or whatever, if we don't have 
ice if you don't have uh, Mother Earth, we have uh, one planet. And if we are talking about uh, indigenizing, the, I'm trying to say that we have to take care, a good care of our homeland. If we can adopt indigenous relation to lands as a taking care of our homeland, about our home, about our family, we can fix it. Thank you. And uh, um, my another <laughs> role today is to be interpreter for Pavel. So. <laughs> Спасибо большое за приглашение. Для меня всегда посещать и приезжать в Дартмут – это большая честь. К сожалению, я сейчас вынужден живу в США из-за того, что я сейчас просил политическую поддержку за давление на меня со стороны правительства России. Unfortunately, I uh, have to live in the United States um, because I'm a political asylee here, because I was uh, forced to leave Russia uh, because of the pressure from Russian government. Uh, and when I um, uh, uh, when I was in the, this situation, uh, Dartmouth uh, helped me a lot, and it was a first, uh, first uh, help and assistance that I received. And uh, I'm And uh, I want to say uh, thank you, Ross, for your help and assistance. Я хотел бы сегодня рассказать об одной, эта история, конечно, очень большая, но я постараюсь ее рассказать очень коротко. Today, I want to share with you a story. Of course, story is big, but I will try to make it short. В 20-м году на Таймыре в России Норникель, одна из крупнейших компаний в мире, совершила экологическую красоту. Uh, in 2020, uh, the uh, one of the biggest uh, nickel uh, mining company, or nickel, uh, was a cause of uh, the biggest uh, uh, ecological catastrophe in the Arctic. It affected uh, drastically to uh, indigenous communities in Taimur. Uh, um, any. Um, Attempts to connect, uh, to, to get help or connect with the Russian government uh, were um, failed. И тогда мы приняли решение обратиться к Илону Маску. And when we decided to to, um, to reach Elon Musk, с просьбой, предложением не покупать никель или никель. And uh, we asked uh, Elon Musk uh, to not buy nickel from Nornikel. Uh, and uh, that is a connection that that was a time when uh, Tesla, uh, or Elon Musk actually posted on Twitter, as you know, he, he does this thing, uh, about how he uh, his company is ready to um, to, uh, to buy more nickel. And uh, Nornikel answered uh, him on Twitter that uh, uh, Nornikel is ready to fulfill uh, his uh, Я могу сказать, что для работы, такой огромной работы, нам начали помогать экологические организации, правозащитные организации, организации современных народов по всему миру. And for this uh, job actually to make this uh, statement, to bring it to Musk, uh, we got a lot of help from ECAR organizations and uh, our allies around the globe. Мы написали письмо Илону Маску, и это письмо дошло до руководства. We wrote a letter to Elon Musk, uh, and uh, it was reached to his CEO uh, management. Я знаю, что наше письмо было передано лично в руки брата Илона Маска, как я являюсь членом совета директора Tesla. Uh, our uh, letter was uh, um, personally handed to uh, Elon Musk's uh, brother, who is also on a board of uh, directors. Uh, 
And also our board of uh, directors uh, received his letter as well. Я, к сожалению, не могу говорить. У нас начались переговоры с компанией Tesla, с менеджментом. Я, к сожалению, не могу говорить много подробностей, потому что я подписал письмо на разглашение. I'm, I'm, I'm not professional <laughs> interpreter. Uh, uh, we got uh, uh, we got in, into negotiations with uh, uh, Tesla and their uh, CEO. Unfortunately, I cannot share details because I signed the um, NDA, right? Uh, non disclosure. Yeah, NDA. No, no disclosure. This is what we discussed менеджментом компании Tesla вот эти вопросы, которые нам передали. But the uh, part of our conversation was uh, the, those suggestions from uh, coalition. Uh, 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 я сразу могу сказать, что um, переговоры у нас прошли очень успешно, мы считаем. Uh, um, our coalition uh, um, um, reached our goals and uh, uh, negotiations were successful. Uh, я э, могу только упомянуть, что э, компания э, Tesla не сотрудничает с менеджментом. I can only uh, share some details and one of this that Tesla uh, does not have a, uh, agreement with Nickel. И второе, что э, в сентябре 2021 года компания Tesla э, в, своей, в своих внутренних документах э, компании приняла положение о соблюдении прав трудных народов. And uh, uh, second, uh, Tesla internally uh, adopted, um, adopted um, their uh, policy on, uh, um, on, indigen uh, on, right. on indigenous rights. Uh, it was uh, done in September 2021. Ну, я также могу сказать, что um, мы встречались со швейцарскими банками, с немецкой компанией ЕЦ. Uh, we also uh, have meetings with uh, Swiss uh, banks and uh, uh, European BASF, yeah. German companies. Yeah, German companies. И могу сказать, что ряд банков вышли из акционеров Норникеля и продали все акции. And uh, some of the uh, banks uh, actually uh, um, withdrew, uh, withdrew their um, uh, Uh, support from uh, from uh, Tesla uh, to, from Tesla uh, and uh, sold uh, and sold their uh, share, shares and no uh, further investments are going to Norinica. Я могу сказать, что после всех наших акций компания Norinica вступила с нами переговоры, мы с ними вели активные переговоры, которые, к сожалению, сейчас из-за войны были первые. And uh, uh, at the end of our, all our um, Actions, uh, we got into our coalition. We got into uh, negotiation with uh, Norinkel, and we were negotiating with them uh, about how to con uh, how to build uh, Norinkel uh, policy on indigenous rights. But unfortunately, because of the war, uh, all these negotiations were interrupted. Я могу сказать, что по итогам, результатам нашей работы по Норникелю мы вышли на решение коренные народы, несколько консультаций с коренными народами мира и создали такую коалицию, которая будет защищать в целом заниматься защитой прав коренных народов в том числе. In the result of our work with uh, Tesla Norinkel case, uh, we got into several uh, consultations with indigenous peoples from uh, uh, from all seven uh, regions, uh, global seven regions, and uh, uh, now we uh, created a coalition uh, which uh, will be uh, protecting indigenous rights in terms of the uh, conflicts with uh, green economy. И последнее, о чем я хотел бы сказать, что этот успех, конечно, был бы невозможен, если бы у нас не было партнерства, в том числе с академическими кругами. 
And the most important thing that I, uh, I want to say that uh, our success would not be possible uh, if we would not have a, a coalition with uh, uh, others and especially with uh, academia. Я могу сказать, что э, Стэнфордский университет, э, мы с ним начали сотрудничать в этой работе, у нас они сделали нам, наверное, одну из самых э, лучших да, дейта, базы по Норникеле. Они собрали всю информацию. Да. Stanford uh, University, I, uh, is that ecology yeah. department? Yeah. Oh, uh, uh, they uh, helped us a lot because they uh, collected uh, the best uh, uh, database uh, uh, on uh, non-nickel, including their um, sh uh, all these investments and our uh, information, which helped us a lot. So, of course, it helped us a lot. And all this information uh, helped us a lot uh, during our negotiations and meetings. Спасибо. That's it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all for these really... This is, I, it, in some ways, I'm thinking that the, the conversation we just had touched on so many elements that connect back to all of the conversations, all of the presentations today. I think we have a, a few minutes for, for some conversation. And I would say we are a little over time, so if people have to leave, please please feel free to. Um, but if you can stay and would like to uh, join in conversation, um, that would be great. Are there, are there questions for members of the panel? Ross? Yeah, just, just more of a comment. I want to thank Pavel for his comments and for his time Dartmouth, it's always an honor to have you on campus. Um, and I think you bring up a very important... Pavel, I want to thank you for your comments. And, and it's always an honor to have you on this campus for your long history of uh, standing up for the rights of indigenous peoples throughout the North, but also worldwide. Um, I think you raise a really interesting point in that in much of what we're talking about in this energy transition, carbon economies, will involve uh, minerals and resources that are found on indigenous lands. And it's very important to remember that, you know, nothing about us without us as a guiding principle. And I think as uh, Arctic Studies works on this, and, and it's, it is a challenge, but a very central one. And I hope, I'm sure that the Irving Center will also um, take into account that uh, active engagement and partnering and co-production of knowledge with indigenous peoples is a core principle about how we begin to think of a new future with indigenous peoples. So thank you for that point. And thank you for your, your willingness and wanting to work with the academic community. It's, it's, it's admirable. So thank you, Pavel. Great to see you again. I just wanted to thank this panel. I think um, this is something as we work uh, sort of nationwide and partnering with other university and energy and society types of institutes, one of the most important things I think that we're realizing and recognizing as a community is, is a gap in expertise in how to communicate complex issues, uh, to tell the stories properly, and to translate our research uh, as academic institutions into relatable, actionable, um, arenas where we can really begin to drive forward uh, impactful projects and programs and part of that is also telling the impacts of these stories and being able to invite that dialogue to the table. Um, so I feel like this panel really for me summarizes the whole day of the opportunity and the call to action as we look forward um, but how we as a college uh, band together think about some of these critical skill sets um, that may be even uh, a step or two outside of our our training or our, you know, um, experience in how to get the word out about the research um, and, and make it relatable and translatable so that we can take action. So uh, for me, this was a really compelling panel and, and I'm sorry that even at the end of the day, um, it, it won't get as much of, of the recognition that it, it truly deserves. This is an area coming back to what's happening across the country 
that I think many universities are struggling with. And I think uh, at the college, we have an opportunity to really uh, take to heart what we heard in this last panel and really think about how we can build capacity um, and grow this as, as a means of getting what's happening on this campus out into where it needs to be uh, to drive the action that I think even, you know, and not summarized in his talk around, you know, the people who are uh, buying the products, um, the companies who are making the products, uh, uh, people who are buying the things, you know. Um, so for me, it, it, this really resonated. I wanted to thank you. Can I just have, do you, did you want to respond or make a comment to this, or should we? Yep. Okay. Thanks so much for your all of you speaking. I feel like the t first two speakers gave some homework and things to learn about, and I had a question for the last uh, two speakers. Um, I work with the I've worked for a number of years in Mapuche, we teach Indigenous people in Southern Chile, <coughs> and one thing that they struggle with, and I've kind of heard similar themes, is kind of in, inland protection being framed as activists and or at times more extremely as terrorists, indigenous people, kind of how you understand that because it's a difficult terrain when, when oftentimes with, when people are against economic development projects, it can, it can be seen as a political action and I feel like indigenous peoples are often, um, it's kind of, there's multiple, it's framed as, as, a, as an against something instead of being for life and for land and for territory. So I don't know if you understand my question, but kind of how you've responded to, to different attempts by the government or others to frame your actions in negative lights and, and how you understand your work and your, um, your land protection. Спасибо большое. Ну, первое, как я, я уже сказал, да, что я, я считаю, что коренные народы в расовой работе должны находить союзников и быть этих союзников нашим. Uh, first of all, uh, the um, work of indigenous peoples, of course, is a uh, hard of work, and uh, first of all, we are trying to uh, look for allies, and uh, uh, we, we, we found actually uh, allies. Well, И я могу сказать, да, что наши аргументы в переговорах, в том числе с компаниями, да, с церковью, с швейцарскими банками, они подкреплялись научными исследованиями, да, нашими. То есть мы разговаривали на одном языке. Uh, and uh, I can say that uh, with our conversations uh, with uh, Swiss banks, with Norwegian, with Tesla and other companies, uh, we used the arguments from, uh, uh, from researchers and we actually spoke on one language. Поэтому я думаю, что в принципе в компании тоже работают люди, да, которые слышат друг друга. In general, I think that uh, people work in uh, companies as well and we, they can listen to those arguments as well. Я могу сказать, например, что я одно время читал курс в высшей школе экономики в Москве в институте нефти и газа по правах коренных народов. То есть добычи нефтяников. Some time ago, uh, I actually uh, was uh, given um, lectures for Institute of uh, uh, Oil and uh, Gas in uh, higher economic education school. I might be wrong. <laughs> uh, uh, in Moscow, uh, and uh, that, that lectures were for uh, uh, future of oil and gas industry. Uh, on indigenous rights. Uh, and I think that uh, dialogue and discussion are very important for understanding for everyone. Конечно, к сожалению, мы сталкиваемся с давлением, с традициями, да, но... Of course, uh, we, unfortunately, we uh, face uh, repressions and, uh, uh, and the pressure from governments, but... Но у нас хорошие союзники, да, ученые, правозащитники. 
but we have uh, good allies uh, as a researchers, uh, um, the ecological uh, um, organizations, and uh, um, uh, civil uh, civil rights uh, organizations, etc. Uh, I can uh, add. Uh, um, uh, I can add that uh, what I learned from our Native American brothers and sisters, they are all connected again, and uh, this is what we are trying to say. And uh, I don't want to use uh, uh, words uh, decolonization only for us now. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, what we are talking about is uh, more like I don't like to be uh, facing like indigenous uh, peoples versus you know because. Uh, they are here not trying to be uh, separated or be, um, you know, like different and stuff like that. Because actually, what we want to achieve is uh, only to keep this planet, <laughs> you know, alive and have clean water, have a uh, uh, health, uh, 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 health, and basically, you know, you know, like basic human rights. As a supplement to this critical indigenous knowledge, I would add that in sociology, there is an extensive literature on social movements that specifically discusses framing and counterframing, which is sort of a big picture way of looking at the problem you raised of indigenous activists being framed as terrorists. Um, it turns out that there's a sort of a dynamic that can be generalized about how to counter um, framing like that in a way that's effective and that reclaims public voice and space and legitimacy for indigenous actors and others. I'd be happy to share that with anyone who's interested. Does that connect to the inoculation? Exactly. Is this also sort of an area where? I would imagine there's an extensive <laughs> literature and speech as well. There is, yes, and we've actually specifically applied inoculation theory to framing and found that we can preemptively shift frames um, prior prior to movement. So these are alliances of the kind that we need, right, to actually support each other in this conversation. Um, for, uh, yeah, unfortunately, uh, Pavel has a, um, another commitment for uh, Ukrainian uh, live streamed uh, TV channel, so he has to run. Yeah. Well, we have run over. I want to thank our guests especially for this final session. Please join me in saying thank you. And then April, do you, do you have a couple of closing remarks, I think? Thank you so much. And I know we are over time, uh, but that was such an important conversation, so I appreciate um, those of you who will stay uh, to finish. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for being here. Obviously, we're calling to a close our, our very first Dartmouth our Faculty Symposium on Climate, Energy, and Society. Um, so thank you all for participating. And for those of you uh, who made this possible, uh, it was about you today and hearing uh, all that was going on across the college. And I just want to reemphasize what I said in my opening remarks, that uh, in fact, this is just one fourth of the faculty that we've even identified. And we're going to continue the work throughout the year uh, to have these conversations, uh, facilitate these types of dialogues on an ongoing basis, uh, and continue to learn more about the depth and breadth of expertise across the college in this area. Um, we now have a much better understanding of ongoing and planned research in the space of climate, uh, sustainability, uh, health, energy, and society at Dartmouth. Um, I'm leaving feeling really invigorated about the hope uh, and opportunity for our future at the college uh, in this space. Um, we know that the challenges created by climate change are much bigger than just us alone and us doing it um, you know, by ourselves, and that it will require collaboration across disciplines, industries, governments, and societies in, in order to meet this challenge. I think this last panel really drove that home. Uh, so we will all have a role to play in how we move forward. And um, I don't know about you, but I, I don't like attending, especially in these post-COVID reality uh, of our precious time and recognition that nothing is guaranteed uh, in dialogues like today where uh, it, it's sort of the one-off conversation and then we all go back to our corners. Uh, what we would like to do is inspire all of us um, to think about bold leadership, uh, thinking about our full potential for unlocking um, our expertise, uh, our cross-pollination of, of ideas and solutions across the college, 
um, working together for a just transformation. Um, obviously, of our world, we have a global mission. Uh, there's a lot of work that's being done domestically, but I think we heard a lot today about the, the, you know, that's being done across the world and it can be applied in other uh, regions of the world. Um, I, I won't go in knowing that we're short on time, but you know, hearing, I think, William Shatner, who wrote on uh, SpaceX, his um, sadness, actually, once he looked back at Earth and then realized the vast hollowness that was beyond uh, Earth. In other words, we have an opportunity and obligation to protect the balance of the ecosystem in Earth, and, um, and that's something I think we should reflect on. So we want to act with uh, focus and purpose and intention uh, and hope uh, together. Um, so for me, uh, to you, this is obviously just the beginning. Uh, some of the things that, and I will do the, the, the build, uh, but thank you for building to the team. Um, I like things that move. Um, you know, some of the things that we want to leave with in terms of specific actions to take uh, today within the coming weeks, you know, are thinking about our faculty collaborations. We have the dynamic connection boards outside of the lecture hall. You know, we are on the second floor, the Institute team itself. We have faculty throughout the building. Um, this physical 55,000 square feet is our home uh, for these types of hub-like conversations. So we would invite you in as often and as frequent as possible to come and use the Institute as a home to have, uh, to facilitate these conversations in our space. Um, it was really nice to see the vibrancy of the atrium today with the, the diversity of, of representation across there. Um, consider becoming a faculty affiliate of the, the Institute and associated ongoing seminars that we, we plan to launch and continue. Some of them are organic. Our PhD and postdoc students are already leading some in certain areas. There's some reading groups that are uh, emerging. So we are here to help seed and support your best ideas uh, and to foster the growth of them. But we are not here to dictate to you what they are or how to do it. Um, so that's a great way to do it, becoming a faculty affiliate and thinking about ways to either participate or lead in some of these discussions. Please, if not, take it back to your departments uh, and to your schools and have the conversation internally. Uh, we're, we'll still be here. Um, join a scientific writing training session. It's very intentional, I think. We've heard a lot about some of the opportunities to increase our own um, professional training in, in a lot of these areas, and we have an incredible resource on our team that's a shared resource with Grant GPS, Andy Hoffman. An innovation in and of itself with the support of Dean Madden and others in the provost office to think about innovative ways to bring uh, the best of Dartmouth forward. Um, and so we are innovating even internally in how we bring these resources together. So in partnership with Grant GPS, you know, Angie is, is leading uh, training sessions on writing, uh, you know, technical scientific writing, uh, grant writing. We have a deep need to increase our climate communications uh, uh, training. Um, so these are just some of the many things. We want to hear from you what your ideas and needs are. Um, we'll have a newsletter that's focused inwardly around research and faculty. We've just overhauled our website as well. We hope to be telling a better story for you as well, using the website as a resource so that you can find all of this wealth of information and don't have to go and you know rewatch the video of today uh, to sort through it. So I've just been leading the effort with Melissa uh, to really overhaul a lot of these resources to make it easier for you to find each other. Um, so the newsletter will be one such uh, upcoming um, contribution to that. And obviously, we'll be having a number of things like you know, updated events, funding opportunities, et cetera. So uh, we encourage you to uh, give us feedback and input on how we can continue to evolve in this space. You know, and I think what you can expect is that we will um, be reaching out again and again and, and wanting to have this conversation um, more than just once. So thank you all. Um, and you can find more information about the Faculty Affiliate Program and some other stuff on the website. But uh, thank you for being here today, and we look forward to working with you uh, in the coming weeks and months. Thank you.